Welcome to Talking Doctrine. Thank you for joining us. Uh, tonight we have a special guest. We have Luis joining us this evening. He's got a, uh, a unique testimony that uh, we all want to hear and Lord willing you guys do as well. Uh, he's going to be able to go through the different types of Judaism um, on a first hand basis. So all most of us, me uh, especially, have been able to read into it. I don't have too many Jewish friends. Um, so praise God, Luis, uh, uh, he just told us off air, he got saved about three years ago. Praise God, he reached out to us and uh, uh, introduced himself to us so that, that we can learn more about it. So if you don't mind, if you'll uh, open up with uh, a testimony, it doesn't have to be short, doesn't have to be long, however the Lord leads you, and uh, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Again, I appreciate the, the opportunity, and thank you for all the gentlemen here uh, for inviting me. Um, I'll try to keep it concise. There's so many details in between, but uh, in short, um, I came to know of uh, a Jewish ancestry, and I say this in quotes because, I mean, obviously in the New Testament we're not to look up for genealogies or ask questions about these genealogies, but uh, for the sake of conversation, I, I was introduced to Jewish roots in, in essence uh, through my father. My father's originally from Mexico, and uh, uh, from what I've been told, I mean, there there were interesting little practices that the family would do in Mexico that was different from other Catholics or Christians in the surrounding area. Um, I, I've been told that my grandfather, uh, who has passed away, um, moved from Mexico City or or locally around Mexico City into Guanajuato uh, at at some point in time, and and just brought a lot of these unique traditions uh, in in the jewish circles they call them the moranos or the or the secret jews that were forced to convert to catholicism how much of that is true or not i mean only god knows the the mexican government destroyed so many documents and and records it's probably impossible to know but uh at, in, in my teens my i was always uh asking about god uh, my father said, well, you know, all I know is that there's Catholic roots, there's Jewish roots, but I lean on the Jewish roots. When I came to the United States, I worked with Jews, and so I saw a lot of my customs that were being done by the Jews. So I'm, I'm Jewish, and, and, and we have these traditions, and I'm going to say that, that, that I'm Jewish. And I'm like, well, what's that? Explain that to me. And so he would... Uh, get to a point where I just asked so many questions as a kid that he said, I'm just going to take you to a rabbi. And so right by our home, he took me initially to a reform synagogue. And, and that's where I started learning more about Judaism. I actually took an intro to Judaism class while I was in high school. Um, I got really involved. I mean, I was a nerd. I mean, I went from going to school all day long straight to the synagogue. I mean, I even missed my prom. I didn't do any of that normal high school <laughs> uh, things that kids do. I was just always at the synagogue. And so I, I had to go through a conversion process because in, in rabbinic Judaism, if, if at least in uh, conservative and Orthodox Judaism, if you're, not, if you're not from a Jewish mother, then they make you go through this conversion process. In Reform Judaism, they, they go with patrilineal descent. They take, a, ironically, a more biblical position on, on who is a Jew there. Um, but I started in reform and then I saw that that was a little bit too lefty loosey for my liking and, and moved up to conservative. And then uh, my rabbi in the conservative synagogue said, well, you're about to graduate high school. You know, what, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, well, rabbi, all I've been doing is coming to the synagogue. So all I know is how to be you. I want to be a rabbi. And so he recommended for me to apply to what was then called the University of Judaism, which is in Los Angeles, just north of UCLA. And now it's called the American Jewish University. They, they since changed their name since I graduated. And that was the only school I applied to and, and got in. And my intention was to, to go and learn how to be a rabbi. And so my undergraduate degree is in Jewish studies. Um, but while I was there, I... I was in the inner circle, so to say, of, of conservative Judaism. They have a seminary on campus, uh, the Ziegler School. And I just got into so much trouble in the sense that uh, 
I just saw that the conservative movement was everything but conservative. There was nothing left that they were conserving. Um, and, and what really broke the, the, the camel's back, so to say, was in December of 2006 when the conservative rabbinate decided to openly accept uh, uh, gay and uh, lesbian uh, students to become rabbinical uh, candidates and, and be ordained. Um, and so I, at that point I said, you know, I'm about to finish school and I'm going to apply for rabbinical school here. And in a pre-interview, you know, the dean just said, I, I don't think we're going to be a fit because the way you're describing your theology and what you believe, I think you would be better suited for, for the Orthodox. And so I got in touch with Orthodox rabbis and had to go through another conversion there in the whole process. And, and, and it was interesting. But, but yeah, as, as I progressed more into uh, a traditional or, or at least Orthodox theologically, I was probably more laxed behind the scenes than, than people in the community. But uh, but definitely, at least theologically, I, I was more orthodox in, in, in what I believed. And so, you know, after after graduating, uh, I last, actually my last year of studies, I, I came across uh, a community in Mexico of people that were leaving Christianity and Catholicism and looking at Judaism. So I was kind of like a reverse missionary I, I, through a, a rabbi friend that I have. Uh, who was working with that community, I actually went down to Mexico and was converting these presumed Christians in, in quotations or former Christians and Catholics to Judaism. So I, I didn't kill like Paul did, but in a way I did kill spiritually as I look back. And, uh, but at that time I had no idea of, of Jesus other than the historical figure that you're taught in, in university. And, and then soon after, after that time, I eventually immigrated to Israel. I told my parents, you know, I got to go and, and just do the, the typical uh, move, and that's go to Israel. I want to learn more about Judaism, and I want to experience, be part of, of the land. So, yeah, I, I, I hold an Israeli passport to this day. I hold a Mexican passport because I lived in Mexico. But, but the, the country of my birth is the United States, and so... And so, yeah, I ended up moving to Israel, and and I was a teacher there, uh, working in schools, teaching English and things like that, uh, history, social studies. Um, but uh, I I went with the intention to study more. So on on my time off, I would go to different yeshivot in in Jerusalem and and meet with different rabbis and and learn as much as I can. And when I left Israel, I left very very uh, disillusioned. Um, I would get into, uh, as, once I read the New Testament, I, I, would get, uh, I would get the idea of what Jesus felt like because I got into a lot of arguments with, with the rabbis. Um, I can recall times where uh, we were given opportunities to give a drash, which is like a sermon. And, and as I look back, I would use words that were kind of similar to that of the New Testament. You know, why are we fighting with our enemies? Uh, can we pray for them? Is there anything we can do? And I'm speaking this way, not knowing Jesus, not knowing the New Testament. And I would get in arguments with the rabbis. Uh, there was one time the rabbis got so mad that they just ran me out. And, and one rabbi told me, you sound like somebody that came before. And so I'm thinking in my mind, well, who, Rabbi Hillel, Gamliel, who are you talking about? And now as I look back, he was talking about Jesus. Because the way that I would use certain words and terminologies and philosophies, and so he knew enough to make that, that recognition. And so I, I've always told people, I think the, the greatest believers in quote in the sense logically of understanding are, are the rabbis. They do know, I, I firmly believe that, that these rabbis do know who, who Jesus is textually. I mean, I've gone to rabbis in, in, in the movement uh, after being saved and, and even before being saved, you know, what do I do with these verses that are coming up? Uh, you know, what, and we would look at the verses in Hebrew, prophetic verses. It got to a point where rabbis were just like, I don't want to talk about this anymore. They would not even give me apologetics. They would not give me anything to defend the faith. They would just shut it down. And so those were red flags. And so by the time I got exposed to Christianity in general, it was through Catholicism. And so that was a very short-lived uh, uh, a, a point, you, you know, I was introduced to 
uh, Catholicism, the Virgin Mary and all the saints and all these ideas. And, and so I truly believe that I had spiritual revelations. I, I had dreams and all these things. And so the, the sensationalism of, of being in, in the Catholic faith, but it was short lived. Once I, I even considered, uh, uh, you know, going forward and, and learning more about Catholicism at, at a deeper level. And once I got to that point and, and read their catechism and started uh, asking questions, I just said, this just looks like Judaism. It, it's literally the same uh, religion uh, and in, in the sense that there's an oral tradition and that kind of takes equal position, if not more than the written tradition. I mean, I just felt like I was dealing with the rabbis all over again. And so that was very short lived. And, and, and so I said, no, I'm, if, I, if that's the case, I'm gonna stay in Judaism. Uh, and, and so I just got in touch with, with my rabbis and said, look, you know, they had no idea I was researching Catholicism or Christianity or anything. I, I just got back with my rabbis and said, look, I just want to finish what I, what I'm here to do. I want to get my rabbinical ordination. Uh, you know, let's get this done. I, I want to be able to tell my parents I did what they invested so much time and money to do for me. So eventually I did get, um, ordained as as a rabbi privately so i didn't go to a major you know seminary like uh yeshiva university in new york or anything it was it was a private ordination um but at that point i was just already the seed was already planted uh about jesus in my heart that um i i was already on the ropes uh that i i kind of already knew that that being a rabbi was going to be short-lived and eventually it came to to a head back in 2014 when when i met who uh hilda my wife and at that time in june 2014 she was already in the process of converting to judaism this was before she she met me so i met her right at the end of her her studies and you know we got to liking each other courtship and all that and it got to a point where well now you know, I'm going to move closer to you so we can be together and let's get married. And I had to come out clean. I'm like, this girl just converted to Judaism. I'm supposed to be a rabbi. I'm supposed to be leading the example. And I believe in Jesus secretly. And so I, I, I eventually just come out with it and I tell her, look, you know, before we get married, this is where I'm coming from. And Here's the biblical citations. Here's where what I've been researching, and and I believe Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's and not just the Messiah; He's God Himself. It was not a pleasant experience at first, you know. I mean, keep in mind she had just converted to Judaism. She had asked me questions before, uh, you know, who do you think Jesus is? And I would give her a very rabbinical answer. I would say, well, Judaism teaches, but I would never really say, I believe this or that. And so she's like, well, what happened? I would ask you these questions. I said, well, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's the dice that I had to roll. It's either you're going to stay with me or not, and, but I just needed to be up front. You know, if we're going to go forward, uh, I, be, I believe in Jesus Christ. And, and so after, after talking, you know, uh, we, and explaining and showing biblical citations, she, she, she was convicted as well. She said, you know what, I, I think I made a mistake. And, and 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 she said, "I want to be. I want to be saved. I want to be uh, with Jesus. I want to. I want to believe again. Uh, what what I was taught before, obviously, was off or or was not uh, convincing to me. And now that you've showed it through me, through the 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 spectacles of being a former Jew, uh, it it just made a total sense. And and so yeah, in a nutshell, that's." <laughs> That's my whole my whole background there, and so uh, in two thousand end of two thousand fourteen two thousand fifteen we met a pastor uh, at the time in Yuma Arizona, and uh, he gave us the plan of salvation. Uh, we we accepted Jesus Christ, and then shortly after that we were baptized, and here I am today. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now, now, an awesome story. Now, really, something that I'm curious about is, you know, looking back, now, even though Jesus did say some very stern things against the the rabbis, the Pharisees, and the, and the Sadducees, 
seeing some of the things that he said to him that were just, look, whosoever believeth in me hath everlasting life. Like his true heart for him, even though that they were so hard dead set against him that he wanted so bad for them to just be saved, to just believe that I am who I say I am and you can go to heaven when you die. And they just so strongly rejected that. I mean, it kind of, sh and really today they have really the same spirit toward, toward that and the same attitude toward that, toward Jesus. Um, it really kind of breaks your heart when you think about it, that he wanted so bad for him to be saved and just, all oh, you just believe on me and you can have everlasting life. And they just, they murdered him, you know, and, <clears throat> you know, just, I, I don't know. I, I'm just kind of curious on uh, some of your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, most definitely. Um, the I, I was initially exposed to um, to the New Testament as a whole by by a Jewish believer who who happens to practice Catholicism. So that's a whole other story for another time. But uh, but nonetheless, um, I was introduced to 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 the New Testament, but interestingly via through jeremiah chapter 31 verse 31 and and so and i'm going to paraphrase here because i'm not a I, i'm not a, you know one of those that memorizes word for word the king james unfortunately hopefully i get there one day but uh but in essence it talks about a new covenant being made and and one that was not done before and so what what jumped out at me was at that time i said well don't don't give me that that christian bible you know because obviously that's going to be uh, a mistranslation and she's like okay well do me the favor look at your JPS your Jewish Publication Society translation of the Hebrew side by side with the English and then tell me what it says in the Hebrew because I you know I grew up Jewish but I don't speak Hebrew and so I went there and and even to this day in, in the state of Israel the most hated word is Brit Chadasha New Covenant New Testament and so when I'm reading there, Jeremiah 31, and the most hated word in the modern state of Israel is looking at you straight in the face on the pages of God's word, it melted my heart. So I just felt something, uh, what, what I presume the Bible calls that veil being removed in the sense that I was now faced with a truth that I couldn't deny. And, and what was I going to do about it at that point? And so that led me into the Gospels, and I've read the the New Testament as a whole. I'm not, again, I'm not the type that can quote things off the, off the cuff, but uh, what primarily hit me were were the Gospels. For me, that it was like the the movie, the Never Ending Story. I, as soon as I opened the book, everything just started coming to life because I lived in that land. I I, I mean, short of the crucifixion and 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 the beatings and and the scourgings. I mean, I, I could relate to Jesus. The arguments he would have with the Pharisees were, were the same things I was arguing with, with the rabbis today. You know, why are we teaching this? Why aren't we going out? If we have the Torah, if we have the answer, why aren't we going instead of sitting here on, on Shabbat and, and eating and getting fatter? Why aren't we taking this food to the guy across the street that literally is sitting there hungry? Their answer was, well, because uh, we can't walk a certain amount of distance and that would be breaking Shabbat. I mean, these most ridiculous, mundane, man-made laws. And so when I begin to read the Gospels and Jesus saying, well, you know, you're giving up yourselves to man-made traditions and you're not even getting close to what God is asking you to do. I mean, those things became real. It wasn't just, oh, that's what happened back then. It was live. It was resonating in, in my soul. And, and so to me, Jesus, uh, I mean, was just more than than just a person on the page he he was somebody that was family i can relate to you know spiritually and even nationally even at, at that point i you know i was still strong about being jewish so i even felt wow you know he's a jew he can i understand him he lived in the land he speaks my language i can i can i can work with this you know and and i truly and to this day i i believe that that everything is that that's there in the gospels is is the truth and 
again, you know, I, I, I don't hate the Jews. I want to preface this. You know, I don't, you know, dislike them. I'm praying for them. I don't bless them. And we can talk about that when we get into doctrines. But I pray for them because, uh, and, and I truly believe when, when it says to the Jew first and then the Greek, it's truly because the Jew and the Greek have something in common, disbelief. The reason why we go to the Jew first is because they disbelieved first. And so that's why it's my obligation as somebody who came from there, you know, and, and hopefully God gives me the courage to do it more often because I'll admit I'm not in the synagogues and the Jewish communities preaching or anything like Paul or Jesus did, um, but that eventually I can get to something similar to that point and, and help bring uh, that remnant of Israel, which I feel that I'm a part of physically, nationally, and even within the church, um, uh, to, to awaken them and, and save as many as, as we can through Jesus Christ. And so for me, again, uh, to sum it all up, the New Testament, it's not just a book. It, I, I open the page and it's like a page just popping out in, in real life. And, and anyone who has ears and, and eyes knows what I'm talking about. Right, exactly. And yeah, God willing, he'll give you the courage to maybe return to some of those synagogues in Israel and do what Paul said when he was preaching daily in the synagogues, trying to get them saved. And he even said in Romans 10, it's his heart's desire for Israel that they're saved. But they, he said that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge and that they just they wanted to go about establishing their own righteousness. They didn't want the righteousness of God that was in Christ Jesus that we can't ever attain, that we have to just accept as a free gift, that he perfectly lived out what we were, that what God expects man to do. And that because we were all with sin. And that is the unfortunate thing that I have seen you know, with my family members, <clears throat> even even my family members that are Jewish in the secular world that aren't practicing Jews, they think that they're, they have this weird idea, like they're better than everybody and they're just so much above the rest of the world and uh, they're, you know, <laughs> God's just smiling down at them while they're, you know, literally, I mean, all doctors and lawyers and corrupt and 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 just stealing from people and just being terrible to other people and uh you know just not really you know but still you know wanting them to to have that free gift of everlasting life that's that you know it almost makes you want to just grab them and shake them just i mean you can just you can live forever you can go to heaven just stop trusting in your own self and trust in Jesus. And, you know, so it, it is really frustrating too. And, uh, <clears throat> but Daniel, I've seen you were trying to say something. Yeah. I had a question for you, Luis. Um, here recently I'd seen a video and since you were basically on the inside, you know, as a rabbi, um, I saw a, a video recently talking about Isaiah 53 on the rest like the forbidden chapter like they're not really supposed to talk about it or something can you can you give some insight on that what your experience is with that yeah definitely um that was the chapter after jeremiah that i was next ex exposed to um uh, simultaneously with the new testament uh i mean i think it speaks for itself i mean anyone who re i mean anyone who reads that and, and I've done that before. I ha I've had Jewish friends where, where I'm just reading uh, Isaiah 53, not telling them what the book is or anything, just reading verses. And they're like, stop reading the New Testament. So they logically, they logically from at least from what they've heard or what they've learned, whether university or on the streets or by word of mouth, they know of this concept of this Messiah dying. And, and the person that I was speaking to at the time knew enough to say, stop talking about the New Testament. That's kind of like what happened to me initially when I was challenged. I'm like, stop talking to me about your New Testament. So see, internally, I knew enough based on what I've seen from the outside world, but not realizing that that was actually coming from, uh, from, from the Old Testament. 
and and so again i mean i think it's pretty close you you you're, you're going to have you know uh jewish apologetics like uh different rabbis that come on youtube and and try to refute it um I, i'm telling you right now they they they're trained to do that they they're trained to play the tricks i i hear them i i know what they're doing uh i i'm i'm reading it. It, it they won't do it from the hebrew rarely have i seen a rabbi really go verse by verse from the hebrew to an english speaking audience uh uh trying to explain it if you, if you if you listen to videos that are completely in hebrew that are from israel uh you you'll see how they they'll be cynical and and uh and sarcastic about christians as they're speaking but since nobody really understands the language outside of 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 israel you you really would never know and tell and so again it comes back to that's one of the chapters that i went to you know uh, colleagues of my former colleagues of mine uh reform conservative and orthodox i said guys what do you think I, and and we're reading this in hebrew my my reform and conservative rab, rabbi buddies i mean they they just don't even know hebrew they know enough you know to to read it phonetically but to go deep into it so once i realized they just had no no knowledge of how to even discuss it from the linguistic point of view i went to the orthodox rabbis in israel and in the states and and i said what's happening here explain this to me you know and this was even before you know coming to the lord you know just shortly coming to the lord i said i i want to stay in judaism help me defend the faith and i and we would read it verse by verse and i'm like but what about this it says this here and it says that here it got to a point where the rabbis just said I don't want to talk about this anymore. Never once did they say, you know what, Luis, look, you know, you're misunderstanding or here's the grammatical syntax or here's hyperbole or here's this. Nothing every single time across the board, Ashkenazi, Sephardic, Mizrahi, you name the type of cultural Jewish background rabbi, every single time it was a similar message, I don't want to talk about this anymore. And so they know. They truly truly know in my heart of hearts they know mentally who Jesus is and what he and what he had to say. Spiritually the veil is there though and that's what we have to pray for. And so again Isaiah 53 I mean speaks for itself. If if you can read that in English or Hebrew I mean you don't even need to know Hebrew the English does it justice. Uh and and so and and again I I challenge I challenge you if if you ever have the opportunity to sit with somebody that's Jewish just randomly read out loud some verses from 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 Isaiah 53 not telling them what it is and you'll be surprised at their reaction they're always going to say enough with your christianity and and then you're like what are you talking about i'm reading from Isaiah <gasps> what what are you talking about that's not Isaiah and sure enough it begins to open a seed because that's what happened with me and and i was taught the gospel there wasn't no special jewish gospel that was packaged just for me it was straight up the same gospel recognize that you're a sinner recognize that there's you know the answer and the answer is Jesus Christ and if you you know believe on him and confess that you're saved and then post your salvation this is what you need to do to be disciples so i didn't get this special you know messianic package the way these that i'm battling here in texas with messianic jews and all these other hebrew roots issues uh that i mean i i've met with messianic rabbis and quotes that are trying to use the talmud and the and the tanya and the kabala to convince orthodox jews i said i'm sorry you don't need any of that you just need the gospel stands on its own and if they're truly meant to have gotten it they're going to get it anyway and so your our job is just to go to the jews or to anyone but specifically for the sake of our conversation you go to the jew the way you would go to anyone else with the simple straight gospel and trust me if they're meant to get it they're going to get it you don't have to package it in a persian way or a jewish way or in a african way i mean you just give it to them straight and and that's how it worked for me so so yeah that's my answer sorry i know it was long winded <laughs> no, that's, no, that's, that's awesome yeah i mean your your testimony is amazing luis i mean there there's parts of it like when you're talking about jeremiah 31 you know where i'm getting chills just hearing it i mean it's it's such a powerful uh testimony there and i actually have a lot of questions for you i'll try to get a couple of them out tonight and then we can always maybe have a follow up but i love the journey you went through the spiritual journey of going through the different religions and getting bits and pieces of the truth that ultimately led you you know to christ and it, it's a process of 
going through that for an unbeliever sometimes going through that journey to gain that knowledge as, as you were seeking out truth so it's interesting how you went to Roman Catholicism you said for a short period and um, I'd love to hear what some of those dreams were that you had in a minute but my main question was just to fill in some of the gaps of that story so you went from you know ortho you went from like a liberal Jew to conservative to orthodox to Catholicism what what was sort of the breaking point or the realization point that then brought you to Jesus himself at that at that point hey, am I audible am I there okay um, so yeah uh, again I gave you just the the breath and the highlights but if we if we're gonna go into some details um, after Israel um, I came shortly back to the States and then I took a position in Mexico um, as a as a professor of ESL English as a second language so I, I worked at a, at a university in, in Leon Guanajuato and it was there that uh, I met through the university and and, and through some students and family members uh, uh, so a priest that that came and he he said you're an English teacher you just came from Israel I have so many questions can we sit down and talk and I said sure that's fine no no problem and so we sat down and we began to talk and and I said you're young you know what what made you become a priest because in my ignorance at that time um, all I knew is priests were celibate so I just came from Israel I lived in Tel Aviv you know I lived in Jerusalem I mean I, I went with the intentions to be religious, but trust me, I, I, I lived my life. I, 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 saw, I saw things. I mean, not, nothing, no drugs or anything or, or sex or anything like that. But I saw enough to know that I lived in the world, you know. And so I said to this priest, how are you so, I mean, you're, you're young, you're a handsome guy. What are you doing signing your life away? And so interesting in love, he didn't start with Jesus. He started with the Virgin Mary. And so that uh, got my attention as to well, why Mary and, and so he, he was in this religious order that was a uh, very Marian type they, their, their focus was was on Mary and so he claimed that he had a, a prayer this revelation um, you know he, he at that time he he had a girlfriend and he had to decide I'm about to go into the seminary should I stay with this girl and get married or move on to to being a Catholic priest and so he prayed to the Virgin Mary and so um, and he he prayed and, and at some point he claims that that the rosaries began his rosary beads began to illuminate and and he was talking about this as a vivid live situation and so that grabbed my attention because in my heart I, I was very upset because I said even in that moment I can recall praying in my own mind to God Lord I was just in Israel I was in Jerusalem I was there I, I, I did the best that I could now I'm away you see in my mind when you leave Israel they call you uh, somebody that's fallen away and so now I have this guilt of I fell away I left the land and you brought me to Mexico this you know this pagan country everywhere you look it's indigenous or idols and statues and and yet now this Virgin Mary is answering this priest and he's not your chosen people he's not where were you how come you didn't answer me in my need when the rabbis turned against me and when I had to fight against them and argue and all. and so that was going in my mind and and so I said wow you know this is interesting let me let me let me hear about it and and I know my mom on my mom's side she definitely grew up Catholic even though she was not uh, she's even to the, this day now she's saved thank God uh, but she was never a real practicing Catholic and so I, I know that we had that origin on that side of the family. And, and so I said, hey, what the heck? I'm going to try it and, and try to learn more. And I want to know about this Virgin Mary. And so I even did the risk. I even said, hey, you know, I'm going to pray to this Virgin Mary and see what happens because Jesus and everyone else, nobody's answering me. So I, maybe this lady will answer me. And so I made certain prayers and and said hey you know because he taught me that the Virgin Mary is the mother of God the mother of Jesus and the mother of us all and so I said well hey if you're my mother you know show me that I'm your son too and I'll be a part of this church and so in, in, a, in a short story I mean there's so much more details 
but in essence, I, I know that my mother, at least on her side, she had baptized myself and my brothers when we were babies. And so I began to ask her, well, you know, I, I grew up Jewish because of my dad and all of this stuff, but I want to know about your side. What, what are your origins? How do I find out, you know, I know that you baptized me. And, and so she said, well, go to this church. This is where you were baptized and your, your certifications are all there. And so I called that church and I went. And, and prior to going, I had made a particular prayer to the Virgin Mary. I said, if you show me literally you're my son, then I will convert and I will go and, and serve. And so I received the, the baptismal certificate. And my mother's name is Rebecca. On the certificate, uh, there was a discrepancy because the, the secretary at, at, the, at the parish there asked for my birth certificate to make sure to verify my identity with the, with the baptismal certificate. And she asked me and said, well, we have a problem here. What's your mother's name? And I said, well, my mother's name is Rebecca. And she said, well, we have a problem on the baptismal certificate. It says your mother's name is Mary. And that's all that it was. It was Mary. And so I remember the prayer. If you show me literally you're my son, then I'll have, I'll have nothing else to do but to convert. And so that's, that was the initiation into Catholicism. It was this revelation, not the gospel, not, not hearing the gospel, but this sign and then as later, after Catholicism, after arguing with the priests and the bishops, I mean, I got to the point where I was talking to bishops of Orange County in Los Angeles. And, and I, I'm looking at the New Testament and I'm saying, here's, here's a contradiction. I can't argue that this event didn't happen. But what I do know from the New Testament is that even the devil can dress as an angel of light. And so that was the connection that I had to make and say, the only way that I'm able to hear and understand Jesus is through the gospel, hearing it being told the gospel, and then through faith accepting him. So I didn't accept him at that time. What I accepted was this, this false religion and this, and this revelation or this event that, that occurred in physical sense, but I've been warned in the New Testament to be careful about signs and wonders. And so, and that's what happened with the Catholic Church to the point where I, I made friends and I visited a seminary in uh in 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 california and i was asking them because i i had read if you don't have the son you don't have the father and so that would include jews muslims anyone that doesn't believe in jesus christ regardless of your national origin and so they were teaching me that well you didn't really have to convert you're jewish you you were kind of grandfathered in you you were given this covenant or at least your ancestors were given this covenant theoretically, if I'm truly connected to them, only God knows. But, but theoretically, your ancestors received this covenant. And so now Holy Mother Catholic Church teaches that we don't necessarily have to proselytize. We hope that you would come. And then they showed me in the catechism, and that's truly the case. I mean, and, and so I said, no, something's wrong. If this is truly the church that Jesus Christ started, they're completely way off. They're going off of oral traditions. And right away, I got rabbis, red flags, rabbis, 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 Pharisees. And I said, uh, no, if that's the case, I'm going back to Judaism. And so that was like a short-lived, not even a year uh, experience. And, and I said, no, I'd rather be in Judaism if that's going to be the case. And so that was on the back burner there. Uh, but there, after that point, the seed was there about Jesus. I needed to research more. And then God just sent in. So to fill in those gaps, you know, God sent in people uh, to, to start enticing me to actually go and physically read the new Testament. And then once that occurred, that's when the actual true conversion came to be. So I hope that answered your question. I know there was a lot of yes, detail. That's right. why I avoided to <laughs> and you know, you know, what's so amazing much. about that is that, even in my experience, soul winning, and I'm sure Ashton's experience, knocking doors, soul winning, <clears throat> the hardest thing to break somebody out of is a personal experience that they had. Well, I had this, I started speaking tongues and everything else, and that's how I know, or I had this, uh, this feeling, or I had this revelation or the Mormons, I had this burning in the bosom, I had this experience. And so hearing someone with the rationale to be like, all right, well, I'm gonna take what the Bible says over my personal experience 
if my personal experience contradicts the Bible is a pretty amazing thing to hear because it is the hardest thing to break people out of is their own personal experience because which i think satan loves he loves to use these little ways to trick people and deceive them into following like like your friend who i'm i'm sure you're convinced that he is deceived by a devil and he really thinks that he's following god but he's been deceived by a devil <clears throat> that's that's disguised as an angel of light named mary and and that he probably really did have some experience, but that he was he was deceived, and and you know it's it's really hard to break people out of that um, when they have some sort of emotional connection to something to break them out of it and just show them clear scripture and for them to accept that and say okay I believe that and not this thing that isn't found in the Bible, <clears throat> but, uh, there it looks like in on the, on the side chat here, it says, what is the difference between reformed Orthodox Jews and which is more popular in Israel right now? Are there many Christians in Israel? Okay. Yeah, that's a very good question. And so, uh, I'm going to try to give it to you as uh, concise as possible. Uh, what what defines reform, conservative, and orthodox? Apart from, you know, gays being rabbis or women being rabbis, all these or abortion acceptance or not, all these hot topic issues. What theologically separates the orthodox from conservative reform is how they each view what happened at Mount Sinai. Okay, so the the orthodox traditional position is this: at Mount Sinai, Moses received the written Torah. Okay, so that's what in essence are your first five books in your Old Testament. Simultaneously, the elders that could not go up on the mountain, but who were at the foot of the mountain, received the oral tradition. Okay, and so uh, here you go, that, 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 that's the root of the, of the faith there, and that's where they grab their authority. So these elders at the, at the rim of the mountain are, are hearing this voice, and God is telling them, in essence, simultaneously with Moses, Moses receiving the written, but he's also receiving the oral, um, but they're hearing it as well. And, and so basically God, apparently in, in this one breath that he's speaking, uh, is telling Moses not just the written, but how everything would be interpreted to the end of time. And so th this is how the, the rabbis conveniently uh, claim their authority. And that's why in, in Judaism, um, uh, until the Messiah arrives, uh, they're basically it. You know, if you go against, uh, in fact, I have, uh, I'm going to turn my back just for a second. I have a section of the Talmud here. I'm looking right at it. It's uh, Eruvin 21b. Uh, and it says the following, anyone who transgresses the words of the scribes is liable to death okay and so you know the parallel to that in the new testament is mark 7 8 okay but right from the talmud itself and i have it right here put it on camera see it's the actual talmud page okay and and i and i did this research just before <laughs> uh we got online here because i i i, I assumed at some point uh, a question would come up like this and so the, the emphasis of rabbinic Judaism is exactly what just said there, the scribes, this oral tradition, uh, how to interpret. And so the Orthodox believe that Moses simultaneously received the, the oral and the written and the sages uh, below or elders below the mountain receive it as well. And that they have passed it on and that it is uh, God's word. There's no separation from this oral and written. And if there's any contradiction, there's it's not that it's contradicting. You have the problem, and so, and so that's why you can't interpret it on your own. You have to have a rabbi there with you. Now, what I'm find, oh, sorry, real quick, Louis, before you move on from that, what I really find interesting about that is there is no written record of the oral laws being handed down or the oral tradition being handed down, right? So we just have to take their word for it. Is that is that basically how it works? 
Well, I, in essence, you know, the, the short answer is going to be, I'm going to play devil's advocate and say, well, I just showed it to you. See, here's the Talmud. We wrote it down. It was passed down from somebody, from somebody, from somebody. And now it's here. So now you don't have to worry or question. No, no. But how do you know that that actually happened? Ah, faith. Faith right. alone. You know, so, so. Obviously. Which is, which is where you made the connection with Catholicism because they do the exact same thing. <laughs> exactly. That, that's why I say the, the mother of Catholicism is Judaism <laughs> or rabbinic Judaism in particular. And, and, and so, yeah, that's, that's what it comes down to. At the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a matter of, of faith. Um, uh, you know, a Pharisaic rabbinic Judaism was, was the religion in the first century. Uh, so what is interesting is that they argued more for a, a Messiah. So in a way, I guess, historically, that particular faith or idea or philosophy was necessary to to have the concept of Jesus as a Messiah to come into the world. So in some sense, I guess historically we have to uh, at least take it at face value as to this, you know what, what they're saying uh, allowed for this religion to to occur because obviously Jesus cited more with the Pharisees than the Sadducees or any of the, uh, the other sects that, it, that existed at the time of Judaism. And so it's it's a slippery slope there, but but to the point that now you have to accept these man-made laws, which we say man-made. Jesus is saying man-made, but in their mind, it's not man-made. It's it's identical word of God in comparison with the written word of God. And so th there's no separation. It's kind of like in in Catholicism, there's no separation from the curia or the magisterium. You know, the the catechism is the Talmud of Catholicism. Does that make sense? And so they're right. following I, that same tradition. I just find it fascinating that there's literally not one single word in any of the Old Testament, in the Torah, any of it that says, you know, I have given my oral law to the elders or any, not, not one single reference to it. So the, the verse they're going to use, if I'm sorry to interrupt, but, um, yeah. and I don't have it off the top of my head, you'll forgive me but something to the effect where uh, you, you need to uh, uh, listen to the leaders and the magistrates of, of your time. I forget what book it is in, in, in the Torah exactly. You'll forgive me for not having the citation. But that's what they'll point to. They'll say, oh, well, see, God told you he's going to set up leaders and elders, and whatever they say, you need to follow. Um, and, 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 and so that's what they'll use. But I, I think it's really taken out of context there. It's, it's not yeah. in relation to yeah. that specific event. So you yeah. don't Cause what event. God, what God told them to follow was his word. True. <laughs> yeah. So, so you don't see this event until you get into the Talmud and the Midrash, uh, specifically where, where you're getting these, uh, fill in the gap stories that you don't see in the Bible. That's basically what a Midrash is, is the rabbis come in. And 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 fill in the story that that the 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 events that you don't see within within the text, and that you have to take on faith. And if you don't, you know, you're liable for death. I mean, it says right here, you know, if you yeah, me it says you you're liable for death if you don't accept it. So it's not even an option. So conservative and reformed Jews, you're out of the you're out of the picture. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds a lot like when I was in Honduras. The uh, it's a little bit different Catholicism in, in Central America versus America. It's there's too much Bible in America, so it's very like smoothed over a little bit. But down there in Honduras, they were straight up telling the people, "Don't read the Bible, or Satan will steal your soul." So I mean, that's just the way it is down there for the control. But it's just amazing the uh, just how. It, they're all the same because they're works-based salvation. So any religion really comes down to that. But it's very interesting the way you're, uh, you know, seeing how you've been through those different phases, and so you know it in and out. So, and then about the uh, the oral tradition, I wanted wanted to say, you know, so how did the elders get that oral tradition? What you know, they're a little bit busy with a golden calf down there at the bottom of the the mountain. Mm -hmm. So you know, great point, Daniel. <laughs> That's a really good point because they weren't waiting patiently and obediently for Moses. They were making a golden calf at that point, while God was supposedly giving them that oral tradition, right? 
Uh, so yeah, great point there. I also find it interesting, you know, it's kind of like what Nori was saying is that they were told to be in obedience to the elders who were themselves subject to the written law of God, you know, so it that's it's just the hierarchy. It's saying respect your elders in relation to the written law, you know, and so it, it is a twisting of, of God's word there. But fascinating to get an inside, you know, and resource explaining this to us because we can research it online and you know a lot of times the sources even that are coming from our side can be very biased when it comes to looking at other false religions but when you go directly to the source someone who's been on the inside seen it firsthand and this is what they actually believe I can take that to the bank now and know okay this is what I'm dealing with when I talk to an Orthodox Jew, you know, or when I talk to a rabbi. Uh, but yeah, please continue with um, the differences. You know, I think that was a great yeah. question. Yeah, so, so that takes care of Orthodoxy. So just to recap again, they, they believe that Moses and these elders in particular uh, uh, received uh, both the handwritten Torah or the, the first five books of the Old Testament plus this oral tradition. So then when you go to conservative, um, you know, they initially... Uh, had that theology and then as time progressed they 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 kind of when biblical criticism became became you know popular in the universities in the 1800s into the early 1900s um you begin to see this shift in conservative judaism and and so they they believe that there's the possibility of of moses uh uh, receiving this revelation, but that Moses in particular didn't write the text in its entirety. It's written over time. Um, you'll look at the two kingdoms, Israel and Judah. They're going to go with the archaeology and say, well, look, there's vocabulary in the Torah that came from northern Israel. There's vocabulary that came from Judah. And you'll see that you'll, there's even uh, uh, books and, and versions of the Bible that are color-coded. If it's blue or if it's green or if it's red, it's from this particular time period. And so they ultimately believe that they give lip service to the idea that, that this event occurred, but because we now know through archaeology and science that the possibility is not 100%, we want to give honor to our ancestors and, and tradition, but the, the man-made part can change. And so you're going to see often the conservative uh, rabbinate get together they're not going to change the written Torah, if, I mean, even if they look at it at all, but they, they're going to change the, 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 the man-made, the Talmudic uh, rabbinic literature. And, and they've done that, you know, to, to quite an extent. Right, um, like how you were saying, well, now the, the culture accepts sodomites, so now we can accept sodomites, or so on and so forth. Yeah, and, and you're going to see this with uh, uh, one of my former professors, Dr. Elliot Dorff. He's a conservative rabbi, and so he was in favor of that move in 2006. And so, uh, in essence, uh, his thesis, if I'm giving him justice <laughs> to it, um, is, is this, is that at that time, when you're talking about sodomy in the time of the Bible, it's something that was imposing. A, a conquering nation came, and that was their way of showing that they're in charge. But today, that's not the issue. So they're more about context, that literal detail, devil in the detail of historical context. And today, homosexuality is not a form of invasion or oppression, but now it's a form of love. And so now they've, they've changed that definition. So now you're, you're opening the gamut, the Pandora's box, to welcoming not just openly gay and, and, and lesbian, LGBT, transgender, in the synagogue, but actually now they're leaders. Okay, so wow. if it was a scandal to ordain a woman rabbi in conservative Judaism, now you have, you know, LGBT that are open. Now, Reform Judaism did this way before conservative. They they already allowed that early in the early seventies and eighties, uh, or late seventies, early eighties, um, and so and that leads me to Reform. Now, Reform's going to say. You know what? None of this really happened. This is just an expression of how our people believe they had a relationship with God. And we're going to honor this tradition. But you, more like a, like a Protestant position, you hold the Bible, you interpret it. We're just here to kind of 
be an overrated psychologist without the license you know <laughs> and 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 that's what it comes down to so if that makes any sense that that's the difference it's how it you does. view what happened at sinai it's such a okay that's that's a good frame of reference you know starting at mount sinai but it's it's such a misleading label too because the conservative jews are actually very liberal and then oh, you yeah. have, you know and then you have the reformed are ultra liberal and almost new age right i mean do they do they bring in a kind of new age theology into it or oh it just, yeah this universalist and it's all good or you know yeah in fact you know I, I mean, the the main rabbis that you're going to see on ecumenical boards with the Pope or any other religion are conservative and reform rabbis. I mean, I think uh, Pope Francis's uh, right hand rabbi from Argentina is one of the 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 staff or graduated from uh, El Seminario Rabinico, the, the rabbinic seminary in Argentina. Conservative, you know, so so they're the forerunners of all this ec ecumenical, you know, kumbaya new world order type of you know things that we see on videos and people talk about you know so for me this is real life you know i you know i do worry about these things i'm not going to take a, a paranoid position because at the end i'm with christ and and that's going to be the ultimate answer um but that it's real it's real yeah th this occurs and and this is what's happening in in those uh in those movements and th that's why i say you know conservative reform rabbis are ultimately psychologists without a license you, you spend more time studying psychology than rabbinic theology you know so so that's where that is as well and are his are hasidic jews are they orthodox what is what does it mean when you hear a, about a hasidic jew what is that even maybe okay. even versus like an ashkenazi jew for example you know okay now, now we're going to, okay so now we're going to hone in on just orthodoxy Okay, so is that are they both within orthodoxy? Hasidics Those are are um, are a, a branch within orthodoxy. They're considered the ultra orthodox. Okay, so these guys outside of these guys, there's no Jews. If you're not in their crew, you're you're not Jewish. It doesn't matter how many bar mitzvahs you had or conversions or whatever. You're you're not Jewish, and so. The, these are the guys you're going to see with those big black hats, you know, the curls, the the long coats, and 105 degree weather, and they're dressing like it's winter in Poland. You know, that those guys are your your Hasidic, your your Hasidut. You know, th these are the ones that are overly righteous, and uh, so they're they're an extreme form of of orthodoxy, and they're the ones that are playing a big role at going, uh, you know. Uh, uh, going back to the question about Israel and, and what so what happens with Israel is that the only official recognized form of Judaism is Orthodox Judaism and so if you're a conservative rabbi or reform rabbi you can open a synagogue but you don't get funding from the government only Orthodoxy gets funding from the government that's why you know if you're Orthodox you go and you're studying literally I mean I would get yelled at you know why aren't you coming more often because there's, there's guys studying there 12 15 hours a day literally you know and 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 talk about feminism you want to see real feminists these wives of these guys are actually doing the work having the babies cleaning the house and running a, a nine to five job it's these guys that are the lazy guys going and studying all day long for 15 hours you know so i mean if you want to see true feminism that to me is you know a woman that maintains the whole household that's 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 amazing. And do the Hasidic Jews accept the the oral law as well? Are they big into the Talmud? And, and the are there is there like any difference between like what are other than you know the the exterior and just being really maybe more religious about it? What is the difference between a Hasidic and an Orthodox? You know, I guess the theology. In theology, you mean? In theology, yeah, theology. Uh, not much. It's just how much you want to emphasize that theology. But the, the, the basic tenets are the same. They, they believe they're all orthodox. It's just how orthodox do you want to be? In, it's more in practice rather than it's, it's, it's orthoprax versus orthodox. Like their theology is orthodox. But I, I was more in, in uh, the Sephardic realm. So we were religious, but we were not like, I mean, we would still go out and eat and at a restaurant that was kosher. But these Hasidic guys, if it wasn't a certain type of kosher or this particular rabbi's ruling or something, you, I mean, they didn't even recognize us as Jews, and we were technically in the same camp theologically. So it, th these guys are the 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 very extreme, you know, you, the Satmar Hasidic Jews or the Nutre Carta, the ones that support Iran and 
and and and and go and and have those protests against Israel and all that. So these are considered in in Israel these extreme wings. It's interesting they 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 have an interesting contradiction. They're very anti the state of Israel, but they'll gladly take the our taxes <laughs> that I had to pay as a citizen uh, to maintain right. themselves. So that's an oxymoron. There, it's a very convenient. Uh, position to hold there. So the, uh, the Hasidic Jews are anti-Israel. Um, I wouldn't say all of them. Mostly the a group called Nutri Carta. This is the guys that you're going to see that that hang out with Ahmadinejad and and Iran. You know th those guys are the extreme. The Satmar may or may not uh, uh, fall into that group. Uh, the most lighter end or liberal of the Hasidic Jews are going to be the Chabad, and they're the ones that are the majority. They're the ones that. That everywhere you go in Israel, not here, but in, in Israel, you'll see posters of Rabbi Schneerson, and it says Mashiach Akshav, Messiah now, and he's the image. And so you don't see that here in the States, but in Israel, that they wow. not all believe it, that, that Rabbi Schneerson is or was or will return. I mean, a very similar theology, theology as Christianity, but the wrong person, in, obviously, in, in our opinion. Uh, so it's interesting, but but Orthodox he, he's dead Israel. now, right? <clears throat> yes, he, he passed away. I think in the late eighties. I think, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So do they still think he was the Messiah, or did they wake up to that after he died? Uh, I think here in the states, they're more low key about it uh, because of uh, the imagery that it represents. It's very similar to Christianity in Israel. It's more open. You see posters all the time, or at least at the time that I was there in Israel back in. Uh, 2008 to 2010, uh, it, the, the the signs were everywhere. I was like, "Wow, these guys are!" If, if, imagine all you had to do was change the picture and put Jesus's face, and and they would have the, you know, the right, or at <laughs> least on, on the beginning back. steps to getting to the right place. But it's just the wrong person. Um, so yeah, overall in Israel, to answer that person's question, uh, what's the most popular? The only legal form of Judaism is is Orthodox Judaism. So if if you wanted to, like I saw in your video, um, if you wanted to immigrate to Israel, you, you have to go through an Orthodox conversion if you're already in Israel. If you're outside, the Ministry of Interior will accept a, a conservative or reform. But then once you're in Israel, if you want to get married within the state, there's no civil marriage. So you have to go through your religion. And so if you're not an Orthodox Jew, you're not considered... Uh, a Jew, and then and if you're two Israelis who are Jews but didn't get married orthodoxly, and you have a child, it's considered a bastard child. I mean, so many laws that I can go all night on, and it's just what we say in Hebrew, a balagan. It's a mess. It's a complete, complete mess. So it's kind of like that verse where Jesus said, "You strain a gnat but swallow a camel." I mean, that's I, I, amen. That's, <laughs> and, and, and did you say Allah be gone? I'm sorry. <laughs> the Allah be gone. Like, how did you? What's the Hebrew term? It's oh, balagan. Mess. Balagan means it's a it's a mess. It's all messed up. It's all it's uh, mixed in together. It's it it's it. So we say balagan is is it's just a Hebrew word that we say to say oh, it's just oh messy God. everywhere. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Balagan. I got gotcha. you. Okay. And just a couple. I just wanted to mention a couple things. Uh, Louise, because my phone's about to go dead, so I'll probably more things. The first, there was a supposedly a, and this could just be an internet thing, so whether it's true or not, but there was supposedly a big high up rabbi that had wrote a book that he said he found who the Messiah was, and like he wrote it down, his name, and after he died, it was revealed that he said the name was Jesus. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, what kind of ripple was. effect did that have over there? Yeah, this is Rabbi Kaduri. Um, he, I was actually in Israel at the time, and and that that caused a big ripple effect. I mean, when he passed away, thousands of people came out. I mean, this this man was considered a hachamim. This guy had he was wise wisdom. I mean, he he was very kabbalistic. So this guy would manipulate, you know, in theory, word names of God and and use it to help you out and and change your life or certain prayers he would put your hand and people would test it. i mean all these signs and symbols that that, that were to be careful of and so at, at as i look at the story i am seeing a lot of uh uh messianic jews or christians in israel that have jewish ancestry um uh falling for this story and so i, I think you have to take it with a grain of salt um 
uh, is it possible? I, I mean, he could have had a revelation, but again, we, if we go with the text, I, I don't know of anyone physically going to him and giving the gospel the way the gospel says it should be given, and then through faith you accept Jesus Christ. So the, obviously this is off of revelation that he personally had. It could have been the same situation with me with Catholicism and Mary. I mean, who knows? I mean, I, mean, I can't judge it. All I know is based on the New Testament text, I got to go with the New Testament. Did, did he physically get told the gospel that I'm aware of? No. And so what that entails in the future, you know, he claimed that, you know, once uh, Ariel Sharon passed away, that the, that the Messiah would reveal himself. Um, Ariel Sharon has, has obviously since passed away and, uh, you know, who knows? I, I haven't seen anything been fulfilled yet, so I, I it'll be interesting to see. But um, but I always take it with a grain of salt because these guys are coming from a very mystical, kabbalistic point of view, and we just got to be very careful. We get we, again go with the Bible, you know. If if ever and in doubt, you know what does right. the Bible say? You have to do. Right. All right. The last point I wanted to make was um, there seemed to be in the same video about Isaiah fifty three. There seemed to be a lot of Jews that understood that Jesus was the only person in history who actually fit those prophecies in Daniel chapter 9 about the 70 weeks of Daniel. What's going to happen before the temple would be destroyed? Like they understood that the people came. I'm so sorry. It, it's totally that breaking it, out there. I didn't catch it all. Shoot, they weren't still. Uh, the signal here, but um, that that they pretty much recognized that Jesus did fit the prophecies in Daniel chapter 9. So in the rabbinical community, was there an understanding that, yeah, he did actually fit the bill? to be the one to do these things before the temple was destroyed? Or how do they deal with Daniel chapter 9? Uh, again, it's it's based on depending who you're, who you're talking to. Most of the time, they're just going to say, I don't want to talk about this because obviously it's an inconvenient truth. I mean, we, we know for a fact that, you know, any prophecy that's there is obviously going to fit Jesus Christ. Um, Again, it comes but, but down what, to but what you're saying is they actually they know that this actually does fit him. If that's my, my, my personal question. opinion is if you sit with somebody in that position and, and you look at it line by line, text by text, I mean, in my experience, and I don't want to say the whole nation of Israel believes this, but um, but uh, in my experience of the people that I spoke to that were, you know, fairly decently high up. You know, they, you can just tell in their eyes. I mean, they always taught us in, in Judaism, you know, the, the window to the soul is the eyes. You look at their eyes and you can just tell that that what they, the little that they do know of Christianity, it seems to fit each of these prophecies. And so it's just my personal beliefs that, that I think they know in the sense that they could look at something logically, read it and say, yeah, I can see how it fits. Why don't they accept it is probably the, the key question. And, and my opinion is this, is that it's more uh, uh, an, an issue of position. Okay, when, when you're a rabbi, think about it, uh, and I'll give you my experience. In Israel, if you're a rabbi, you're maintained by the government. You got money coming in. You don't have to think. You don't have to do anything. You, you can be the, the laziest person in the world, and you got money coming in. Uh, look at conservative reform rabbis. They're, they're averaging on coming out sixty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year for being a rabbi. You know, as, as soon as as word got out that at my congregations uh, that that I used to visit, uh, it's so funny. Right after I accepted the Lord, like not even days. I mean, hours to maybe less than two days. I get a phone call. Hey, by the way, congratulations on becoming a rabbi. We need a rabbi here, and, and the starting salary is $60,000. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Now you're calling me? Now you're, Once I've accepted Jesus, now you're calling me? Wow. And so I'm thinking this in my mind. And, and really, it was only like 10 hours of work. So do the math. 10 hours of, a week of work of just going on Saturday, Friday night, chanting the Torah, doing a service, giving a sermon, visiting some sick people here and there. And you're making $60,000 a year. So that's what it comes down to. Do you want to relinquish all that materialism? 
And in my experience, especially in Israel, in those circles, I mean, no matter how much truth you're, you're throwing in your faith, in your face, you're, you're, uh, you're, when you're making this kind of money and being sustained, I mean, again, nothing has changed in 2000. That's the timing of that is very devilish. I mean, you know, you, oh, you I get, knew right away. I knew what was going on. Right. That, yeah, was, I, that was like a direct temptation. You know, it's like here, here's the devil right in front of your face, you know, and, and the devil does that with new believers, especially. You know, it's like you get saved and now he's there to tempt you. And or may, I've noticed also right before you're you're about to get saved, he pulls at you with so many different, you know, false religions and he'll bring people to you to there's like a battle going on for the soul at that point. So very interesting how that that happened. Yeah, all it, true stories. It's, I mean, it's funny. I wish I wish it was a joke, but sometimes, yeah, no, it's it's all true. And and I, I picked that up right away. And so that's what's happening. At the end of the day, whatever the chapter or verse you're going to give, especially an Orthodox Jew, if if they're in the know and if they're in in high position, I mean, again, you, you see it in the New Testament. They, they're not going to give it up. Who would? I mean, unless you're truly inclined to believe, you know. So it, it's not to boast or to make me sound, oh, I had all this coming in or all this potential. Oh, look at me. I gave it up. No, but at the end of the day, you know, that's what's actually coming down to. I, are you willing to, it's like the, like that, that, that moment where, where, where Jesus is talking to that Jew and like, well, what do I do? What do I do to follow you? Well, go get rid of everything and then follow me. Are you willing to let all that go to follow the Lord? I was willing to, you know, I, you don't think I can use $60,000 a year for doing absolutely nothing, really something that I can do in my sleep. I mean, but, but what was it worth for my eternal life? And that's what I had to ask that question. And that's what it comes down to ultimately. It's money, it's power, it's influence. I mean, especially in Israel, it's, it, it's, the, it's corruption. It's, it's just, it's, it, nothing has changed, gentlemen, in 2,000 years. And that's what it comes down to. Right. right. They, they do think that they're righteous. <clears throat> they really do. But, and I was, it was just last week, I was talking to this guy that was, that was Jewish. And, the subject of the Talmud came up <clears throat> and he basically, and, and the thing is, is, is most of what I already knew from the Talmud was stuff that I learned when I was younger, just kind of, you know, a short phase I went through, like how you did just curious about, you know, the religion of one side of my family and especially my grandma being, a Jew from Germany and you know what they went through over there. But uh, he, I, I remembered the Talmud saying something about uh, not even being able to talk about what's really in the Talmud with, with someone who's not Jewish, like things about the Talmud that you're not supposed to talk about. And, uh, so there's a lot of things I was I was uh, bringing up, and he's just denying, 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 and then he finally said, "Oh, oh, I, oh, yeah, I think I know." There was this one guy who was a priest, and uh, you know his name was kind of like Jesus's, but he wasn't the same guy. I was like, "Oh, so he just <laughs> happened to have a mother named Mary. They happened to call him a bastard, just like they did in the Book of John." Uh, it just happened to uh, be crucified for blasphemy. Just happened to, <laughs> just happened to fit all the same things as Jesus. But and that his mother was named Mary and everything else, and got all of his, you know, everything that Talmud says about Jesus. It says his, his siblings' names. It says his mother's name. It describes Jesus perfectly. And then I brought up how the Talmud says that Jesus is burning in hell. Mm -hmm. and that he's well we don't even believe in hell so no of course not that's not in there and i was like you're just a liar you're a liar or you don't know your own you know talmud but it 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 does remind me of you know there's a lot of things in scripture that coincide with the talmud where you'll see like in the talmud the jews side of the story basically and you know what the talmud says about jesus is that it, it, it 
it calls him the son of Pantera like a lot. Yes. And I can confirm it says, that. Definitely. It says that he was the bastard son of a Roman soldier named Pantera and that and that his mother was a, a, a whore. That's what it calls her, that she was a harlot and that uh, she had fornication with this Roman soldier and that, that was Jesus' father. And, uh, and in John chapter 8, it says... Um, they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then they said unto him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. So right there, they, they called Jesus a bastard right there in the Bible, yeah. just like they did. In the, so they were saying that back then, well, your mother was just a, she slept with carpenters and she slept with Roman soldiers and you were born out of fornication. You know, who are you to tell us this? And, <laughs> you know, it's just like the, the, the things in the, in the, in the Talmud that talk about Jesus are so right on in line with scripture. It's like, how can someone sit there and just deny to you that that's talk? No, that's someone else named Jesus. That's not even the same guy. <laughs> is, is that, is that something common that they, that they, that they do? Or was this guy that I was talking to kind of like an exception and he's just out to lunch or is yeah. that something that they usually do? No, that's not Jesus. Yeah, keep keep in mind the the especially I'm not even talking about conservative reform. Just the average Orthodox Jew, okay, is not. I mean, don't assume that because they're dressed in black and white and have the peyote, the curls, that they're studying rabbinic studies. Okay, ninety nine percent of the time, uh, these guys are just uh, people that are following a rabbi, and so they come off as if they're studying the Talmud. And, and, and I'm not a Talmud expert as well. I mean, I studied it in school and, and all that, but I wouldn't dare to say that I know it left and right off, you know, the, off the top of my head. Right, because it is huge. It's an encyclopedia. And so if that's the case for somebody who did study it, what do you expect for somebody who's never really opened the text, you know? And so, and so we, we got to be careful with, with that. We can't assume that because they're, they're dressed like a Jew and act like a Jew and talk like a Jew that, they, that they're trained to be a rabbi. And so that that's the first warning I would give. Um, the the second thing is, I mean, I'm I'm again, I'm going to show you. I'm looking here's a page of the Talmud. I have it right here, in in reference to that citation that you were talking about teaching a non-Jew uh, uh, the Torah. I mean, it says it right here. Ve Amar Rabbi Yochanan, and Rabbi Yochanan said, Ovet kochavim, the the worshippers of the stars, she osech b'Torah chayev mita. Those worshippers of the stars that are that are involved in in studying or the details of the Torah deserve death, and so it's funny, you know, it's funny that they that of, of the word to use for a non-Jew, they say they say Ovet Kochavim. If you look at Matthew two, verses two and verses nine, what did these uh, the traditional wise men? They, what did they say? I saw the star and I came to worship the Lord. Jesus in Revelation 22, 16, I am the morning star. So it's funny how they call these non-Jews Oved Kochavim, worshiper of the stars. Okay, it, it, it's a key word. I was taught, you know, the conservative reform rabbi doesn't even believe what I'm saying at all. They, they don't even look at this text as, as, as divine anyway. But, uh, you know, the, those type of Orthodox Jews that you're talking about, oh, no, that's not what we mean. We don't mean it's a non-Jew or a Christian. I specifically, not only is it a non-Jew, I think these rabbis were writing about Christians because the only people that looked up at a star and came to worship the Lord were Christians. And so this is key word. You know, they, we, it, I remember sitting in classes and the rabbis mocking and, and sarcastically making fun of Christians and what they believe. And it's right here. You know, it's literally right here. It says, a star worshiper that deals in the Torah must die. It's a, 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 it's, it's a sevui, it's a command, must die, it's not optional. So any- Well, any, it's, it's like code, you know, it's like speaking yeah. in code, mentioning exactly. the Christian. They Which all is know what Paul was doing. Paul was following that command. 
Exactly. And so, of course, they're not going to write Meshichit, a Messianic, or Notri, a Christian, what they use today in, in modern Hebrew. They're going to put code, Oved Kohavim. They're going to use uh, uh, false names of God. But, I mean, in another example that I have here, it's, uh, it is in Sanhedrin. It talks about here, there, and again, I'm showing you the text. It's right here, and I can email it to you guys. Yeah, it, it, the Sanhedrin are in the Bible. I'm sorry? And the, and the Sanhedrin are mentioned in the Bible also. Yeah, and so the, this Masechi, this section of the Talmud called Sanhedrin, it, it, it's talking about this. It even mentions Jesus specifically by name. It says, on the eve of Passover, Yeshu, this derogatory term for, for Jesus, uh, Yeshu was hanged. Since nothing was brought forward in his favor, he was hanged on the eve of Passover. These rabbis are admitting to the fact that they brought him to, to trial. What, what was his, his, uh, his charge? He was charged with sorcery, right? So if you go back when he's uh, taking out the demons, no, you're doing it in the name of Bills above. You're doing it in the... They're confirming exactly what's in, the, in, in our New Testament text. And then they have the nerve in the modern day. If you look at that documentary, Marching to Zion, where you have all these rabbis say, oh, no, we don't believe this. And, and that's not true. And we would never say that. It's lies. It's, I'm showing it to you live in person. I'm reading it to you in the actual Hebrew and Aramaic, and it's, it's, it's right there. So they add you know, it to kill him. Funny you say, it's funny you say that, Luis, because I was talking to Afshin and someone else about, about this uh, one day where – because there's a lot of uh, Christians who are now starting to say Yeshua and all this, and I told Afshin that – that Yeshu was a derogatory name for Jesus, not something that, well, that's just his Hebrew name. That's a derogatory name. And that I couldn't remember what it meant, but it was, <clears throat> it's, you know how there's like, like words that are, are it's an acronym for an acronym. For, may he be blotted out. May he be removed. May he be right. Exterminated. <laughs> it's right. It's an acronym. It's not his Jewish name. It's an acronym for what you may he be blotted out. And uh and Jews that I've talked to deny that up and no, that's his that's what Mary called him, and that's what his Jewish name was. And you know, but I firmly believe that that the that God inspired the New Testament in Greek. And that the name the apostles gave was I-E-S-O-U-S in Greek. And that that's the name that God actually gave him on the authority of the Bible. So I'm not saying that someone that uh, lives in Israel today and they speak Hebrew and, and, and calls him Yeshua can't be saved by, by knowing him by that name, but that that's not a legitimate historical name for Jesus that the name that we do know if they want to be like the whole sacred name movement and all those and the Hebrew roots and the Messianics do the same thing. No, his real name's Yeshua and everything like that. And they say that Jesus is pagan. I personally think that they're blaspheming Jesus by saying that his name Jesus is pagan and by, and, and that they're getting in dangerous territory by saying, well, the apostles in the, in the New Testament writing, they used that Greek name themselves, didn't they? Because they wrote right. the New Testament. So you would have to refute apostolic authority. I mean, people like Paul and Peter, they wrote in Greek, you know, Jesus, or however it was, you know, however it was pronounced, you know, back then. Uh, but it was definitely, you know, that those Greek characters that, that you're talking about. You know, so that's, yeah, it's an interesting point. I remember you did, you did mention that to me a while back. Um, as we're talking about the Talmud, maybe an, a, a sort of a related topic is the Kabbalah. You know, we always hear things about the Kabbalah, how it's just wicked and it's numerology and all this stuff. But from the inside, from your understanding of it, what actually is the Kabbalah? Why is it evil? And what's it about? What's its purpose? Or have How you even it? studied it very much? Um, have you, 
you looked into it I, I, on the surface and the only reason is because at the time i didn't qualify uh age wise and uh married and 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 family wise to study it further so there's there, there there's there is certain requirements that you have to meet in order to even attempt to go beyond just the surface at a undergraduate or or seminary type of level of a class if you want to get really deep into it um, th there's some requirements there but what i do know of it is this it falls into kabbalah comes from the word le kabel the, ver the verb to receive okay so what this what the zohar the book is uh is is it's the book of the kabbalah is is the message that has been received okay as if god hasn't sent enough messages and you need to receive another one but nonetheless here you go you have to receive another one according to this tradition and so what it, what the Kabbalah does, it, it does, uh, or the Zohar in specific, it, it, it takes off where the Midrash ended. Okay, so if the Midrash it comes from the word Drash, which means to tell a story or to, to tell a tale, to fill in the gaps. And so the Kabbalah takes it from there, and now they're even going further. And so, you know, they're, they're, what they're trying to do is not only tell you the missing gaps, but the mysticism behind those gaps. Why is it not mentioned? Well, because you can't handle it. You're too young, you're too this, you're too that. And you need to have this, this spiritual enlightenment, this you know, you know, Eastern Buddhist type of philosophy of idea that, of, of, of spirituality that because you, know, you can't handle it, you'll end up like one of the rabbis committing suicide or going crazy in, in the story of the development of the Kabbalah and the Zohar. And so, so again, you're going to have these these uh, these stories that fill in the gap, but on steroids. And so, an example of this is you're going to have uh, a, a repeat of the creation story. So the Zohar is built on uh, there's Genesis, the book, and then there's uh, Zohar Genesis. You know, so they go side by side. And so, you know, for example, from chapter one to chapter two, you have this creation story of Adam and this unnamed woman in chapter one. And then by chapter two, then you get this woman's name by Eve who comes from the rib. Well, the rabbis teach these were two separate women. And so the, this woman in the first chapter is what later becomes uh, one of the, the Mesopotamian gods, Leilit or Laila from night, from this demoness. And so this woman, the, this embodiment, that's where they had that in, back in the 90s, Lilith Fair. You know, it's this feminist, this I don't need men, I'm breaking out of, and doing my own thing that that's where it comes from it comes from that story in in the zohar so this woman whoever she was uh named by that name uh decided to rebel against adam decided to rebel against god so even before eve can rebel and 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 take the fruit you already have a rebellion by this original woman to the point that god converts her into this demon and now she's the demon of the night who comes and tempts you in your sleep if you're a man or takes away the lives of babies I mean, so so totally extra biblical uh, philosophy and theology based on absolute madness. I mean, somebody had to have been high to to have written this this stuff down, and and it, it's just complete blasphemy. And that's just the tip of the the iceberg. I think it's even blasphemous for a, from a Jewish perspective. You know, there, there there's some elements in the Orthodox that just say, "No, nah, this this is." We give lip service, yeah, it's part of our faith, but yeah, we don't touch it, we don't get into it, you know, because it's just, even for them, for some Orthodox elements, it's like, no, that's too much. But now it's it's become so popularized, especially with Kabbalah Center and Madonna, Britney Spears, and all these guys in Hollywood, you know, I, I, I even visited the Kabbalah Center before, right oh, there man. on Pico and Robertson, you know. So, There's a lot of sorcery in the in the Kabbalah. Oh, man, you don't even know the half of it. I mean, when you're when you're in those circles, man, I'm telling you, it's it, it's you're getting into some trouble there and and so that's just one little story of i mean we can go all night on this and 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 so you got to be extra careful these people that are going I, I i deal with this all the time these messianic and not just messianic jews but but people that that had no jewish ancestry they're like and i'm messianic now i'm like oh what do you mean by that are, are you still a Christian? No, 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 because that's offensive to the Jews. I'm like, what? I'm like, so I, I keep in mind, I'm I'm still young in the faith. And so I'm, I'm like, wait a minute, if I'm teaching you about your New Testament, you got a major problem. You know, right. why, why, why are you listening? Because right. we, we've, 
we've had uh, Hebrew roots and Messianic uh, Jews um, on talking to us before. And the way that they totally twist the New Testament is it, it blows my mind because they say, well, anytime Paul is talking about the law, he's only talking about the written man-made traditions that they added to the law. He's not talking about, <clears throat> so Paul taught that you still needed to uh, obey the Torah to be saved. And no, Paul said, you're not saved by the works of the law. And he meant the whole law that Jesus kept the law and that we believe on him and we're imputed righteousness from God because we're not righteous. That the only way that we can get to heaven is to be perfect. And the only way to be perfect is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and to be made perfect by God. So a lot of these scriptures where, where, where Paul talks about, um, were you, were you made righteous by following the law or by the hearing of faith and things like that, or the book of Galatians, um, where Paul talks a lot about uh, Judaizers that were trying to teach them, well, you got to be circumcised, you got to obey the law and everything else. And Paul's like, no, that's no, you're missing the point. And so they twist all that around and say that, that well, if you really read it and, and if you really understand Jewish history, you'd understand that Paul Paul's only talking about uh, the, the, the oral traditions the oral law, not the Torah. And that these were uh, in the new Testament, they were keeping the Torah and they were keeping the Sabbath and they were obeying, you know, the law to be saved when that's like 180 degrees from the truth that Paul was, Paul told him, Hey, all these things. And actually in the, in Philippians three, Paul tells him, Hey, if anyone has, anything to glory about in their flesh. I even more, I was circumcised the eighth day. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was keeping the law more than anybody else, but I counted all those things as dung when I, when I received salvation because none of it counted towards my salvation. I just exactly. admitted that I was a sinner and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, like everybody else. And they, you know, they talk about that a lot in, in Acts that's the topic of Acts 15 is what a continuation from what happened in Galatians and, and, you know, and Peter basically saying, Hey, we're saved by grace through faith, even as they, and <laughs> we, we gave them no such commandment to go tell them to, you know, keep all these traditions and keep all these laws. And do, we just told them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they shall be saved. And, uh, you know, so, uh, do you do you run it? Do you get into those kind of arguments with them as well? On on well, these people they were they were telling them that they had to keep the law to be saved. Yeah, I mean, I I think they hate me more than the Jews, <laughs> in the sense that right. they look at me and they, well, maybe I shouldn't say hate because that's too strong of a word, but there 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 is a confusion or or at the very least a dislike uh, with a lot of the things that I've had to say so far. Um, I think because uh, locally here in Fort Worth, we have uh, a church called Gateway Church, and, and they've opened the King's University, and they're, they're the first uh, university that has an accredited master's program in Messianic Jewish, Jewish studies. And so it's headed by um, uh, some of the, the big wigs in, in the Messianic movement. And so I've had opportunities to actually go and sit with these guys and, and, and ask them, and, and they're just in shock with my theology. So right now there's a big anti-replacement theology sentiment, and, and that's what I think is giving root to, to all of this confusion. And, and it's starting at campuses and universities like this. And so there, there's a hyper um, obsession with Jews and having a Jewish identity, and I think that's where it's coming from. Um, I mean, I, if I have any gripe with, with replacement theology, it's this, and you'll correct me, gentlemen, so, you know, I, uh, but this is if I'm wrong, but what, what I'm, what, the only issue I have with replacement theology is not that the church has replaced Israel, but it's replaced the Jews, a distinction that we forgot, that post-Jesus, uh, being a Jew is something that's not necessarily positive from a New Testament perspective. 
Um, if you, uh, for me, the way I see Romans 11 is that I, and this is why I say, I speak in the past tense, I was Jewish and now I'm remnant Israel. That within the church, there is still that physical remnant nation of Israel from Abraham all the way to somebody like me who converts for the nations to be grafted into to fulfill that prophecy. But that's not the point. The point is the root of, of, of that branch, which is Jesus. And so together we are the church. So I think that's the only difference I have with replacement theology is, is making that distinction where I think from what I'm hearing on a lot of videos is that, no, we've replaced all of national Israel. And I'm saying, no, there's, there is that remnant of Israel within the church, but that's not the emphasis. Right. The emphasis is the church. So if that makes sense, that's where I'm at. So they'll ask me, well, right. well where do you view the Jews? And I say, well, for me, Jew equals non-believer. Greek equals non-believer. What do they have in common? They right. don't believe. So what's my job? To go to my brothers and sisters in the flesh, in quotes, and bring them home to be Israel. Does that make sense? They're all, if you're truly the remnant. Right. Right. It makes yeah. sense with me. I exactly. think I can, I can agree with that, actually. And Paul talks about that, that, that a Jew is not one that is one outwardly, but is one inwardly who's been circumcised by the heart. So and even in his... Right. Even in a sense of that, you know, a Greek becomes a Jew by being born again. And even not more importantly, by part of Israel, right. you immigrate into that existing right. remnant within the church. But now we're the church. It's not you're, It's not about being Israel ultimately. It's a factor within the church, but ultimately the church as the called out ones, the elect. And Amen. that's how I view it. I mean, the, every, every time the new, we see the problem with Messianic Judaism is that they want to go to the Old Testament, interpret and understand the verses as the author intended it then. But the New Testament right. gives you a total definition of what it thinks these verses mean. And so for me, anytime the nation of Israel is talked about in the Old Testament, and, and if they're chosen in quotes, it's that remnant, that little portion that always believed, not the entire right. nation the way Romans is talking about. And so I, I, don't, I don't take for granted or grandfather the whole nation in the Old Testament as being the, the, the God's chosen people. And so people, I'll ask this question, and I'll know where their theology is by this question. I'll ask them, well, do you think the Jews that don't believe, the non-believers, are still God's chosen people? Hands down, I get it all the time. Yes, they're God's chosen people. And I said, I, we got two problems here. Either you don't believe in the preservation of God's word, or two, you just haven't read God's word. And I'm going to bank and hope that you just haven't read it, and you're making this decision based on, on what other people are, are telling you. And that's and and that's what's happening. It's it, it, it's again the problem is not replacement theology. We just got to remember that small little distinction that Israel and Jew are no longer synonymous post Jesus. If you notice in Romans eleven, uh, Paul doesn't say, "Oh, and by the way, I come from the Jews." No, he says, "I am an Israelite." Even right. Jesus, I, I don't I don't know Hebrews. of any place where Jesus actually says, "Oh, by the way, I'm a Jew." He'll talk about Israel. He'll, talk, he'll compare his disciples to being uh, the most righteous within Israel, but he never calls them Jews. The only, the only time he, 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 in a, you know, he indirectly says it perhaps is when he says, I am of, you know, the lion of the tribe of Judah. True, true. That his but to lineage, fulfill that messianic pr prophecy. But exactly. At the, but at the end, that, that whole idea of, of those that are saved, if you, if you look at verse 3 in, in chapter 11 of, of Romans, uh, he's comparing that God is saying, well, I've, oh, the, these men have not bowed the knee to, to this particular God. And so, so it was the case then, so it is today. I'm going to hold on to this little particular portion. And then you look at Romans 9. I mean, not all Israel is Israel. When I read that, I'm like, hello, it doesn't get any clearer than that, ladies it, and gentlemen. It clicks in. That's such a clear verse, isn't it? And, you know, everyone, every Gentile who doesn't have that lineage is grafted in into that branch into that vine right and we become adopted children but what i like what you're saying is that it's not jew it's not greek anymore it's the church exactly you know so that's that's the ultimate focus where where i can completely agree with you on that so uh, very interesting stuff as as far as you know <clears throat> getting into the hebrew roots okay excuse me there for a minute but as far as the Hebrew roots, um, who's more of a laughing stock to the Orthodox Jews? Is it 
these you know hebrew roots people or is it the christians because to me the hebrew roots uh come across somewhat silly to me i mean it's almost like they're kind of a cartoon character of you know true israelite you know christian worship of you know of what the scriptures teach and who the true god is they're kind of they're a hyper view of of these things like you like you said so do the jews you know the the physical jews the physical circumcision look at the messianic jews or the hebrew roots and just be like wow these guys are clowns i mean what are they who's who's more silly to them in a way from from what you've experienced well well keep in mind in 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 my experience uh anyone that's not jewish is clumped into one category so if, if you say you believe in jesus yeshua jesus whatever name you want to use it, for them they're just like they're all the same so behind the scenes is well what can we do and this is where i'm going to get a little bit more conspiracy theory here in the sense where uh well we got an enemy to the to the right of us which is islam in relation to the state of israel we got a friend to the left of us in the states and as wacko and as cuckoo as we think we are or we think they are um uh, let's take advantage of this and so for me there is like a little hidden behind agenda to make the christian feel so guilty and so bad for being who they are that now i, I it's almost like i think behind the scenes they want this to happen in the sense that you you de-emphasize the christianity so much and you mask it with this uh, this need to be jewish that that you now become a camaraderie with the jews and this is all part of the end times uh, uh, prophetic plan that's going to lead to the, the 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 raising of the third temple and set the stage for antichrist and and this is what makes me fear so much because uh, I have I have a friend as we were typing uh, the other night as I was typing to you I was on on a phone conversation just like this and I'm like John you know you you've been a Christian for so long how is it that you're falling into this and I'm just I'm really perplexed I'm just like how do you know Every time he's quoting these doctors at the at the King's University, or he's quoting all of these guys, and not once did he ever mention the Bible. And I'm just like, I'm sorry, man. I mean, call me ignorant if you want. I'm gonna go with the Bible. And so to me, it's all getting set up. There's really not much we can do because it has to happen this way. Well, all is. we can do is try to to make a grace period so we don't suffer as much. But at the end of the day, this is going to happen one way or another. And I think it's all part of the plan. I mean, they, it, it's to the point where now I see Christians, especially the Christian Zionists, they're so guilty for what happened historically. And, and they've forgotten because they're like, we have to be sensitive with the Jews. We've got to be careful. Don't use this terminology. Use this. And I'm like, for what? And they're like, well, the Inquisition and the Crusades. I'm like, you as a Christian should know that anything that had happened in the past these guys were never Christian to begin with. You should know right off the bat, you should not be giving lip service to this guilt trip that Israel as a state or Zionism, uh, and I don't want to blanket all the citizens of Israel or, or, or you know Arab or Jew, Christian or whatever. I don't want to blank them into one category either. But the overall agenda, don't fall into this. I mean, you should be proud. I mean, First Peter says, if you, in some, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase again, uh, if you suffered as a Christian, you've done well. Don't be ashamed. It doesn't say if you suffered as a Jew or as a Muslim or as a, but it says as a Christian. And so to me, I take that to heart. When I die, I'm dying as a Christian, somebody who's following Jesus Christ, the Messiah of not just the people of Israel, but the whole world. I mean, he's God. And that's the whole point. And so, again, I, I, I'm at a loss. I mean, I, I, <laughs> it's almost like a, it's an uphill battle. At this point, I really don't know what yeah, more I to think do. It's it's very interesting i think what, what you're saying because um you know you have you have zionism you know and i think what you're saying politically there's definitely an agenda and there's an antichrist agenda within the nation of israel where we can't be ignorant of that as christians and become christian zionists but what i see is you know we see zionism we see anti-zionism which is fine but then we see hyper anti-zionism and extreme anti-zionism which so you know which is just as wicked i think as zionism itself uh because what you get is what you're like what you said i'm glad you said it that you're not lumping every jew 
into the same boat. You're not lumping every citizen of the nation of Israel or every European Jew or every Jew that lives here in the United States into that same camp because there's this sentiment among anti-Zionists, some anti-Zionists, the hyper anti-Zionists, that every Jew is wicked and they're all the synagogue of Satan and that, you know, they can't be saved and they're all reprobate and they're wicked and, you know, and that kind of thing is not the kind of preaching that Paul, you know, promoted. He he said he would himself. Yeah, he wanted them to be saved. He wanted them to be saved and himself accursed for their sake, right? And so that's the attitude that that we have. So I'm I'm, I'm loving your your attitude and the way that you, you understand that there is somewhat of a of a conspiracy politically. And that this is all leading to the Antichrist nation, you know, where, you know, the Antichrist is going to set up camp in that third rebuilt temple. And, and these sacrifices are, you know, these false sacrifices are potentially going to start. And it's all going to lead up to that. But at the same time, like we were talking about off air, um, you know, I grew up in Encino, California, pretty much Tarzana, Woodland Hills, that area, which is like a hub of you know secular Jews. There are so many Jews in that area. You, you grew up in, in Los Angeles as well, so you know. Um, and most of these people, I mean, some of them were my best friends. Some of them were, were good friends growing up. And they're just average people. They're just your, your typical worldly, secular, you know, they don't really believe in God. They're just, they've got Jewish grandparents or something. And so they call themselves Jewish. And so these are decent people as far as, you know, hum humanly speaking. And so it's wrong to lump them all together and say, you're all, you know, synagogue of Satan reprobate. Of course, they're not saved, you know, right. but they're not worse than your atheist or your, or your. Well, and, and, and in fact, a lot, a, a big portion of people who identify themselves as Jewish are agnostic, atheist, Really, if you get that, like the people that you're talking about who are just, you know, like they maybe had a bar mitzvah, but they really don't believe in God. Right. Yeah. And they I mean, don't practice of, Judaism. Most of them that I've known, and I've known quite a bit, I mean, living up, you know, growing up where I did, I know more about the Torah than they ever will. I mean, it's like they don't, they don't, they don't even read it. They don't know. They just know. You, you learn Hebrew for a couple of years, you do your bar mitzvah, and then you go out and you get drunk and you party a bit and you, you know, and you just do your worldly thing. And they're just like anybody else, you know, who just need the gospel preached to them. Now, the circles that you are in, Luis, you know, you are within, you know, the Orthodox and the rabbis. And so, and even among them, I, I don't think they're all wicked, are they? I mean, aren't there people there that are just, they need the gospel preached to them as well. I mean, yeah. I'm sure some of them are hardened, right? But yeah, like I said, I'm not gonna blanket every single rabbi or or Jew. I I do hold them to a higher uh, responsibility uh, because it, I mean, if we're if we're gonna talk about spiritual, not not the individual, but spiritually speaking, uh, they are causing the everyday Jew that you're talking about to go farther away. And so you, you'll see this in Israel where, you know, the, a lot of the times uh, you'll hear it in, even in the secular music, um, you, you'll hear Israelis sing about this father, in, uh, or this long lost father, this connection. I'm looking for love. I'm look, you know, and, and you're like, wait a minute. It's almost like they're yearning for a, a, an identity with God or the divine. But, uh, but because of these strictures of, 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 the, of the rabbis, uh, they make it nearly impossible. I, I mean, oftentimes that when I spoke to secular Israeli friends, they're like, the, the only reason why we're anti-God, because he's choking us. He's choking us. And what they meant by that is not that God physically is choking them, but through, the, through his you know, representatives, the rabbis, they're choking them. You can't do this. You can't do it. If you want to get married, you got to go to the mikvah. You got to do this amount of dunks because you're on your menstrual uh, menstrual cycle you can't do this or you can't do that don't drive here don't do that i mean all this stuff where, where people are just like i'm done you, you've killed god for me and that's what's happening happening in israel and this is the right. moment where i i truly believe 
Um, and, and I spoke to my pastor about this. And, and, and again, I'm guilty. I'm not practicing it. But at least I admit it. I'm not practicing it. But in, in theory, what, there should be a lot more missions to Israel, to the state of Israel. Uh, regardless of what we believe politically or, or spiritually, there, there's people there that don't believe in the need of the gospel. And so it's, it's very interesting from what I heard and understand. It was a lot stricter back then. I don't know how it is today. But, uh, you know, you can stand in the, in the streets of Tel Aviv and, says Jesus, and say Jesus loves you. But from what I understood back then is if you hand out a tract and the police really were bored that day, they could arrest you. Okay. And so th when, that, when right. that's occurring, that's when you know we need missionaries there. Because not, when it becomes right. against the law, either uh, advertently or inadvertently, you know that's where we need the gospel the most. And, and again, it's to the Jew first. And, and what that Jew means is that they're, they're in unbelief. They disbelieve first. So I need to go to them first. And then I can go to whoever. And then I'll go to Honduras and El Salvador and all that. You know, but that's just my personal perspective. Yeah. Well, and, and the thing about to the Jew first, a lot of that, I believe, has to do with the fact that, you know, Jesus did have that Judite lineage. You of know, and the Messiah, of course, came from the Jews and, and Israel and, you know, who's the promised Messiah. So the gospel effectively, you know, Jesus in fulfillment of prophecy did go to the Jews first, you know, and then they rejected him. And so now to the Jew first and then to the Greek, once he was rejected as their Messiah, you know, the gospel went out into, you know, to every nation. It wasn't just for the nation of Israel. Um, you know, so I think that that's a part of it as well. Uh, but it, and this is the irony that I have with the Messianics. It's like the, the, they'll say, whether Messianic Hebrew roots, to me, it's all the same. At the end of the day, they're just, they're rallying against, uh, uh, you know, for the same, for the same right. cause. They're Judaizers. Yeah. Ultimately, they're neo-Judaizers. They're, they're the modern day Ju Judaizers. And so for me, I tell them, okay, you guys are constantly telling me that Paul observed this holiday. Jesus did this holiday. And I'm like, okay. But they also went into the synagogues. The, so if you're going to emulate Paul on one thing, why don't you emulate Paul and the thing that matters? And why don't you go down to downtown Dallas or downtown LA or New York or Tel Aviv and go and actually, if not sit in their synagogues, wait outside or try to, uh, to preach to them. Oh no, that would be improper. That, that, that would offend the Jews. But you're worried about observing Hanukkah. You're worried about observing Shabbat. I said, Ladies and gentlemen, if you're saved, it's not for me to judge one way or another. But if let's assume you're saved. If you die tonight and you're being judged for the for the actions and the merits you did down here, trust me, I don't think Jesus is going to be pleased with you. If, if your right. if your concern was to go blow a shofar on Saturday instead of waking up with me and knocking on doors and trying to save people, Jesus is not going to be too happy. You might be saved, maybe. I, I don't know. But at the end of the day, I, trust me, if I was Jesus, I would not be pleased, you know, and, and such, that's a, what, great, such a great point because Jesus said the same thing. He said, I hate your feast days. You know, I hate your solemn assemblies, exactly. right? Because they were just observing it at, on the surface. It was a veneer of righteousness and it had nothing to do with actual good works or righteousness and being, you know, ple being a pleasing aroma to, to the Lord. It had nothing to do with that. And that's, that's how I view, you know, the Hebrew roots today, other than the fact that the biggest thing where I, I, don't, I believe there could be some saved among them who got saved and confused. I believe a vast majority though are, you know, just they're not saved because they're relying on a completely workspace gospel of the law uh, most of them that you talk to will say, you know, if you ask them if they're born again, no, we're not going to be born again until Jesus comes back and brings salvation to to the nation of Israel. That's when we'll be born again. Or when 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 is the new covenant? Well, we're not under the new covenant right now. That'll come when Jesus comes back again, you know. And so my thought is if you don't think you're born again, if you, you're not under the shed blood of Jesus under the new covenant, then you're not saved, you know, but, I, but obviously there's, you know, there's some that are just confused that just have that simple faith and they get mixed up in this and they get influenced away from it. So I don't want to lump them all together either, but certainly the ones we've talked to, um, we've had several on this broadcast are just outright, you know, you have to observe 
every law that that we can the only excuse they give is that there are certain laws that they can't observe because the temple isn't here so if i for example if i say well if you're following the feast days why not also follow the animal sacrifices and sacrifice you know all of you know do that and my, my, I was shocked because I thought they would say, well, no, of course we don't do those because Jesus is the Lamb of God, because Jesus is the sacrifice. That's what I thought they would say, but that's not the answer they gave me on this very broadcast. Every Messianic Jew or Hebrew roots that I've asked this question to has said, well, the only reason we don't do sacrifices now is because the temple isn't here. And so we're and in that's diaspora. Why it's okay <laughs> abraham just set up an altar and did sacrifices never was the temple a necessity to do sacrifices in the bible that's so that's already off off base right there you know and the, which they're confused about but you know and to go back uh, to the original premise i mean the, the inner circle of the rabbis they're enjoying this they're laughing it up they're saying, right. oh, we got them. We got them to believe this stuff. And so, and it's not, and it's not because and not of only the that, Jews what you were saying, because of the spirit of Antichrist right. that's floating, that he's laughing. It, it, we have a saying in Spanish uh, uh, the devil's in the corner laughing at me. And that's what's happening is that he's enjoying this. He, he, he loves right. this distraction. And all we can do at the end of the day is, is I, I do the best that I can to kind of evangelize those that I presumed were evangelized before. But uh, again, all I can do is give re-give the message. At the end of the day, it's for God to to work through them and convince them. And and I go into serious prayer because this is, I, I again, it's a heresy that that I thought was taken care of a long time ago. And again, I'm right. I'm not. If you want to, you know, if if you're a native speaker of Hebrew and you want to pray in Hebrew, I mean, I'll pray in Hebrew occasionally. I'm not going to do it in on the public and be like, look at me, I speak Hebrew. You know, what, look how great I am. No, but internally, if I connect that way, I'll read the, the Psalms in Hebrew and chant them because I remember I get a nostalgic, nostalgic feeling, but it's not because, you know, I have to do this or Amen. I have to do this particular. So, so when people ask me, they've asked me, Louis, do, do you get offended if I put a talit or, or if I blow a shofar? I said, ultimately, that's, that's up to you. You're not offending me. What offends me is... If before blowing that shofar and putting that prayer shawl, you're not doing what Jesus Christ asked you to do, that's what's offensive to me because that talit and that shofar and that kippa and all that stuff means absolutely nothing if you're not doing what Jesus Christ asked you to do. So that's my answer to them all the time. And, and what's they dangerous? Just what's dangerous is what you said before about what is in the Catholic Catechism. Uh, which is what a lot of Zionists teach, like John Hagee and other people, which is that, well, no, you don't even need to proselytize the Jews because they already have this covenant and so on and so forth. And, and you know, there are, there are Jews that are not even being preached the gospel because of this ignorance in Christianity that oh no they're god's chosen people they're good to go when hey i just read out of john chapter 8 and the, and the, and and that's the whole topic of john chapter 8. they thought they were well, oh we're abraham's seed we're good to go we're already da, 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 da. jesus said no you're of your father the devil um you need to believe on me and that i mean there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we, we must be saved they have if and like what you said, you quoted the verse. If you don't have the son, you don't have the father. So they're not just, well, they're just worshiping the father and they just don't believe Jesus. No, they. the Bible says they've taken up the star of their God, Remphan. That's what their star of David is. And they're over there right now ready to receive the Antichrist. They're ready oh, yeah, to build it's, a it's temple. It's the perfect setup. <laughs> it's the perfect setup. And... And, and people just don't get it. I mean, the the, the Jews. I, I mean, they're going to fall for it. I mean, that that's the whole point. Oh yeah. But but, but they do think Christians. Think the Christians. They're they're going to accept Jesus when he comes back. No, they're getting ready to receive the Antichrist. Exactly. Exactly. And and I'm telling you, 1948 was the clock starting. That that I mean, from that point forward, I mean, it's just a matter of time before all these events start coming to play. 
Uh, and for me, that, that that's when the clock started. You know, so just watch from this point forward. I mean, I, I mean, and now it's to the point that I'm even hearing reports from friends in Jerusalem where now the the rabbis are even reconsidering uh, the location of the Temple Mount. Was the Temple really where it is, or where the Dome of the Rock is? Maybe it was over here. And now they're gonna watch. Watch. Mark my words. They're gonna start a new campaign of well, let's put it on this corner so that we can all three of us have the same thing. And you're going to see it's going to fall right into place. And, wow. and, and I mean, it's just unity. perfect, perfect timing. That'll bring more unity between the Jews, the Muslims, who can then go ahead and worship the Antichrist together, right? If they don't have to fight over the Dome of the Rock, which is where the mosque is originally, probably is the original site of the Temple Mount, you know, for all we know. But I could see them scheming to move it over so they can kind of all worship the antichrist together but it's yeah, amazing be... yeah. it's an it's speculation but it's it's amazing to see you know this prophecy unfolding before our eyes you know i never thought i'd see it happening in my lifetime you know because <laughs> i was saved back in the 90s and you know we would talk about some of this stuff about one day they're going to rebuild the temple and when one day they're going to do this and they hadn't really, from from what I understand, it hadn't really, you know, started yet the way that they're doing it now. It might have yeah, just now. Been, it's you know, like they have plans. They have uh, the robes for all the priests set up. They have. I mean, they have myself, like the Third Temple Institute. You can go yeah. <clears throat> to their museum in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Excuse me, and it's all there. It, it, it's not a museum piece. Those are the actual, yeah, you know, artifacts that they're going right, to use. The Temple Mount society or whatever it is yeah whatever the institute is, it's not a joke to them and they're actually there's there's institutes you can go and they check your background and see your dna or whatever they do to make sure you're a levi and a cohane and all this nonsense and i'm just like this is for real this is actually going down <laughs> and and it's and that's what i'm saying to me the bible is not just this fairy tale that somebody wrote once upon a time it's coming true how people don't see it my goodness, I'm just in prayer and I'm doing the best that I can to go one by one. The people that I see, I just say, please get saved, you know, yeah. Jew or non-Jew. I, I really don't care. I need to get as many people to get to see this as much as possible. And that's what it ultimately comes down to. And, and the uh, Messianic Judaism is, is really a contradictory in terms. You know, I have no problem with Messianic because in my mind, you know, Meshichit is, is, you know, what it's synonymous with Christianity. It just means somebody that follows the Messiah. Judaism next to it is what makes the contradiction. You, you can't be of rabbinic Judaism or any form of Judaism and be messianic, be Christian. It doesn't, it's like me saying I'm a Buddhist Muslim. It just doesn't make any sense. Right. They're not, they're not of the faith of Abraham or Moses or <clears throat> they have a totally different, uh, it's, it's a false religion like Catholicism or Mormonism. Um, but that actually kind of leads right into another question. Sure. That was asked uh the um how do jews generally establish their connection to biblical characters in regard to their lineage in other words how do they prove to be related to biblical characters it, it, it's a farce you can't it's impossible I, there's no way i could i mean i'm i'm saying i'm jewish why because that's what i grew up with but you know if it, i mean i think that's the reason why god says don't he says it twice you know <laughs> don't don't look into your genealogy. There's a reason why, because it's just going to lead to so many unnecessary questions. Um, and, and how how these temple institute people do it, or what they're claiming, to me, it's impossible. There there is no way. I th those have to be fabrications, or or just somebody's authority. They're going to probably. What I'm thinking is this: they're going to use their magisterial rabbinic authority and say, by the power invested in me by this prayer <laughs> shawl, you now a Levi. And that's what's happening. And that's what's going to happen. And, and, and that's how it's always been. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's the same thing. Like, like my rabbi said, well, you know, here are my hands and this is the tradition and it's been, and I'm connected to this rabbi, this rabbi. It's impossible. How, it's like apostolic succession in Catholicism. How are you, even if you wanted to, how are you literally going to go one by one all the way back? I mean, there's just no way. So my, my the short answer is uh, there's no way. It, it, it never was that way. It becomes that it becomes ethnic and it becomes uh, racial because of the rabbis. I mean, if you look biblically, Abraham is not even a Jew. And, and technically, right. he's not even an Israelite in context. He, he's, 
He's just somebody that came to He's faith. He's from Mesopotamia. Now, the title yeah. is added later of Israel or Jew, but it's, it's always been a faith. And the early rabbis talk like that, but then as you later get into the Talmud because of the Romans and, and, and the raping and the pillage and all that to keep this, it's a farce. They created it out of whole cloth. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, look at Ruth. I mean, you know, Ruth wasn't exactly. ethnically, it's always been about faith. You know, that's always been the case. But this brings up another point, and I, and I hate to bring them up because this is, a, an, an, I mean, a truly racist uh, group. Uh, but have you run across the, the Hebrew Israelites, or, or some people call them the black Hebrew Israelites, you know, and what they believe, just for those who maybe haven't heard, is, you know, that it's only the, the you know, black and Native um, Indians, Native Americans, who are the elect, who are Israel, who are the true Israel, and that salvation belongs only to them, and that everybody else is going to be enslaved. Basically, they're going to become the new slave masters. The way that they were enslaved, it's going to be an eye for an eye. And, you know, everyone is going to be in subjection to these three ethnic groups. I know, obviously, you don't believe that. You know, it's, it's, it's horrific. I think I feel bad for some of them. I think some of them are just caught up in this and they've believed a lie, you know, um, and they're just lost. They need the gospel, too. But have you run across that? And what are your, what are your, your views on, on that particular group? Uh, interesting you bring that up. Yeah, I haven't personally come across him. I started, I, as I was waiting, I clicked on one of the videos where you had that interview with the two gentlemen that, that they had the, the, you know, the head coverings and all that stuff. Uh, I mean, ultimately, again, it, it comes down to this, and, and, and it's across the same with Hebrew Israelites, Messianics, Pentecostal, you'll name it. What is their view on the preservation of the Word of God? Do you believe in the Bible? And obviously, their answer is no, because if that was the case, those two verses, again, about genealogies would, would ex nay any of their theology. I mean, that ju just blanket. So for me, uh, you know, call me a simpleton, but I'm just going to go with the black and white that's right there written. And to me, it's very clear. Anyone that suggests a theology based on race, race genealogy, or ethnicity, uh, you're in big trouble. You got some issues. Amen. Right. I mean, God it is from the Bible. It, yeah. It's not from the Bible. They, they always refer to extra biblical sources and lexicons and, you know, it's never, their authority is never in the Bible, but um, just another group to watch out for. I mean, there's so many in the end times that, that come about. So um, another question from the, I think it, this was a while back from the chat. Um, I think this is the yeah, only my other apologies. question. Yeah, because I see that they keep coming. So I, I hope we don't, I, I got all the time in the world. So, so please, we can, as long as you want to go, we can do it. Yeah, so this question, and I'm, I'm actually going to partially answer it because I, I kind of have an idea on it, and then come in with your thoughts on it and let me know if we're you know in sync on that and if I'm correct on that. But the question is, am I the only one who finds it a little strange that Moses received the complete Torah, and yet the Torah says what's going on before and after it is given? So they're wondering about, you know, how is Moses writing about things that happened after Mount Sinai, if that was all given to him at Mount Sinai. But I think this is my view of it, is that the question is itself um, is misunderstanding the situation, because what God gave to Moses at Mount Sinai was the, the Ten Commandments as well as the, the law. You know, he gave him a revelation of the Levitical law itself, you know, of the law of Moses. He didn't give him the whole first five books of, of um, the Torah. You know, he didn't give him the first five books of the Old Testament in one instant in at Mount Sinai. That was progressively written as far as the historical events that occurred from, from Mount Sinai to, you know, going into the promised land and, you know, or before going into the promised land. And that even when Moses himself, you know, dies in, in the last book of, of, the, uh, of the first five books, somebody else had to have completed the final chapters of, of yeah. that book. So um, per perhaps Joshua, you know, would have been the one to do that. We don't know. It doesn't say who that was. But that's how I view it. It's not that God gave 
Moses the history of what was to come in that moment on Mount Sinai. He gave him the, the, the law of the priesthood. He gave him the Levitical law, the Ten Commandments, the ordinances, all of those kind of things, which he wrote down and then progressively over several years wrote the uh, the Old Testament, the first five books. So would you agree with that or have anything to add to that? Yes, and um, and my apologies if I confused the person there. Um, with the position you're talking about, I, I, I agree with you in, in the sense that that's the modern Orthodox position. Um, again, Judaism is not unified. I mean, even within Orthodoxy, there's discrepancies of what they believe. Uh, there are those circles, very few, but my, minor, but there are those circles that do believe that even everything. So what you're talking about is, um, and what I agree with you is, is that Moses received uh, uh, the, the statements, not the stories. Does that make sense? Um, and so he received the law. This is this, or this is that, and don't do this. That aspect he, he received, that I can agree with you, and that's the more modern Orthodox position. Uh, there are Hasidic Jews and ultra-Orthodox Jews that take the position of, no, he knew it all. Then my question is, well, why was Moses surprised that he couldn't go into the land if he already knew he wasn't going to go? And they'll explain, well, it's just natural human reaction. You know, God told you this was going to happen, but when it actually happens, you you kind of banked on the fact that he would change his mind. And I'm like, that destroys your whole theology. It's like, so they, I mean, it's, it's again, it's a balagan. It's such a mix-up. But in essence, that would be the mainstream position of modern orthodoxy is that, yeah, he received all the, the intricacies of the, of the legal aspects and the interpretations, which equals the oral tradition later. So my apologies for not making that clear earlier. No, exactly. I mean, it's, it's a good question. It's an interesting question. And, and Moses was, you know, the writer of those books. It's just and the Holy Spirit gave it to him you know, by revelation, and he did write it. It wasn't some other writer, as some liberal, you know, theologians claim, but it wasn't all written down right there on Mount Sinai. It was the legal aspect of the, of the law, of the Torah that was given, and then, you know, as they're going through their journey in the wilderness, I, I believe that Moses was writing down, by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, the rest of the story as it was happening, you know, um, or shortly thereafter he went you know he was writing what happened basically it doesn't say the bible doesn't exactly say the exact timing and chronology of that but that that to me is the only logical scriptural conclusion that that we can come to so and and that's where in judaism the the midrash the rabbinic literature within the talmud comes in to fill in those gaps and that's more or less the position that's normative is that it's more when they say torah they're talking about the actual uh, commandments and laws, ordinances, th those things. And then the stories are added in at some point during or after his, his, uh, his presence here on earth. So ag again, it depends on what Jew you, you're talking to. I wish I can tell you it was all uniform, but for such a small nation and, po and population, there's, that's why there's the joke, you know, there's one Jew and two opinions or something like that. I mean, because that's what it comes down to. It depends on who... Who specifically you're talking to but yeah i would agree with you that's the more normative mainstream position for yeah and i, I would orthodox. assume that i would assume that within orthodox christianity as well you know and, and again i've said this a million times i like the word orthodox for what it means but i'm not referring to the eastern orthodox religion course, just, definitely just the conventional historically held view i believe that's probably also the christian view you know is that it was a that stories were progressive Whereas the ordinances, the commandments of the legal aspects of the law were given on Mount Sinai. So, hope that answers that question. I don't, that was that was asked uh, over an hour ago. So, yeah, my apologies. Yeah, again for not addressing it earlier or uh, having some confusion. Yeah, it's fine. We're all getting into discussion. Does anyone else have questions in the chat right now while we're doing uh, Q and A? We kind of uh, winding down here. Do Do you have any? Questions, Nori. Um, I'm not seeing. I was going I back a little bit in the chat. Yeah, I haven't noticed any uh, any questions in the chat. I've been able to pay attention to that. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, Luis, was uh, what's your insight on the Kazarian uh, situation over there? 
um, do you know anything? You were talking about the conspiracy theories earlier. Um, are, are you referring to like the Khazars and the in the kingdom that converted to Judaism? Is that what you mean? Right, the, the Russians over there. Uh, I, I mean, it's it's highly possible. I mean, we it, it came up in conversations in undergraduate school. Um, they'll say that this is the the origins of the of the Ashkenazi Jews. You have the word Ashkenaz in 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 the Old Testament, at least in Hebrew, and all that means is the northern region. You know what is now you know Russia, the Balkans, Poland. That it's called Ashkenaz for whatever the reasons are in, in the Hebrew. And um, and that's where you get the term Ashkenazi Jew is is somebody that comes from that particular region. Uh, Sephardic is somebody. Uh, Sfarad is Spain. Uh, Mizrach or Mizrahi is is east. So uh, if you're from Persia, you would be considered uh, a Mizrahi Jew. You're you're a, a Middle Eastern Jew, Iraqi Jew. Um, and so that's where, where that all is. Now, I, I've been told, I've studied that that's possible, a, a possible uh, origin for, for these uh, uh, white, you know, European uh, uh, Jews that, uh, that, that came into being and now the, they're the popular stereotype for what a Jew is in the United States. If you go to Israel, you know, all the Israelis look like me and, and, and 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 you uh, as well, you know, with dark skin, brown beard, you know, everything there. So, uh, I mean, there are Ashkenazi Jews, but they're kind of winding down in the minority because it's all mixing; it's becoming a melting pot. And so, so is it possible? Yeah, I mean, it's I I I don't see why not. I mean, because conversion, ironically, was always part of Judaism as well. And so, for for them, you know, for me, from my perspective, when somebody converted to Judaism. They they were a Jew. It wasn't an issue of did you your nationality or your blood, you know? Because and that's the and that's the schizophrenia of rabbinic Judaism. In a way, they're like their hyper emphasis on their ethnicity, but then the religion, not the people, but the religion, uh, affords a path to become Jewish. And so it's it's weird. It's almost like you have to be bipolar to to be in this religion. <laughs> And so, is it possible? Yeah, I mean, it I, it would make a lot of sense, you know. I, I you know, but do I know the specifics? I don't know enough to, to say uh, a firm yes or a firm no. I, I I wouldn't be surprised. I should leave it at that. Right, because yeah, even even a lot of their practices have, like some someone, um, who was who was maybe born in the United States or born somewhere and and when they were older decided that they wanted to convert to Judaism, they have to go through all this process, like you were saying, but if they're not circumcised, they just like, they don't circumcise them. They, from what I understand, they take like a needle and like poke the end of their foreskin and, well, it's just okay, so symbolic, they, and <laughs> well, this is where reform conservative come into play in orthodoxy. So, in in, in just uh, to preempt that question about conversion, the, here's the process: if you're in reform, again, reform doesn't accept divine or inspiration of God in the text, and so what they'll do is, if you're interested in converting to to Judaism, they're not going to circumcise you. They they may not even do what is called the hatafat dambrit, which is the the artificial covenant. Uh, uh, you know, and that's where you're talking about where they take the needle and they prick the side of the penis if you're male and draw a drop of blood. Now it's to the point where the, perhaps they won't even do that. That depends on how traditional the reform rabbi wants to be, if that's even possible. Conservative and orthodox, what will happen here is, um, yes, they're, 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 they're potential converts. If you're male, you do have to get circumcised. So whether you do it secularly with a doctor or you do it with a, 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 a Jewish doctor that's trained to be a moil, which is a, a, a circumciser, um, you, you have to, uh, once you are circumcised after that, and I've seen it, I've had students where I took to conversion, older men, I mean, in their 60s, 70s, you know, and, and they're so faithful, or they were so faithful in that particular time that they, they literally went and got circumcised physically, and then on top of all of that, days after their circumcision, I or somebody else had to go back in and prick their penis and, and draw a, piece, uh, you know, a drop of blood. 
and so and so for Orthodox and conservative, that still stands. So the, what you're and referring even to after is they were circumcised, you still had to. Uh, uh, especially if it was geez. done secularly, if the if the if you did it with a Jewish doctor that is certified to be a moral, then you can bypass that extra step. Oh, uh, okay, I see. So yeah, I just wanted to make sure there was a clarification there. But yeah, that I mean that is funny that they have like little. But I mean, you're exactly right with how you um, represent at least how I previously understood um, how they see the Talmud, where you know here is you know the 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 Torah, but this is like well the same the same way that the Catholic same exact way the Catholic Church does it, like here's what the Bible says. But here's the only way you can interpret it. And this is what you have to go to to interpret it. And this is what it actually means and and so on and so forth. So that's why they kind of put it, put the two together. And then that's where you get in get into, you know, their their basic, you know, throwing out of of the of the stories like Noah and the flood and things like that being literal well, that was just symbolic for this or whatever and so forth, <clears throat> you know, but. Yeah, I expect that from conservative reform. What surprises me when I speak to Orthodox rabbis that don't believe, and I'm like, wait a minute, you're supposed to be an Orthodox rabbi. Well, but then again, keep in mind, the oral tradition trumps everything else. And so, right. you know, depending on what Midrash or if, you, or if you're going into the Zohar, it talks it more as hyperbole, as a metaphor, you know, and so when you make that the, the primary source versus the actual primary source, anything's possible. And the devil loves it. He's eating it up. He's, he's loving it. So uh, I have a, another question from the chat, and then I'm going to ask you a question from myself because sure. I need to head out uh, in a minute. It's, it's been a great, great discussion. You guys, of course, you know, keep going without me if you guys want to. But um, the question from the chat is, the the amount of Christians in Israel are th are there from your from what you understand are there you know a, a good number of Christians in Israel is it secretive is it you know tell us about the you know the Christian in in Israel if you know at the time that I was there uh, especially in Jerusalem it was more of that's a church and that's not and that's where you don't go I mean we're walking right by each other and no conversations. So I mean, you're walking by Muslims and Christians. You're you're in proximity and nothing. It's like there's no connection. We don't, you, we don't talk to you. You don't talk to me. And so that's how it was, especially in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and other parts. It, it depends. They're more progressive in quotes, you know, for for their philosophy and what they believe uh, about other cultures. Uh, but spiritually, yeah, in in Israel, there's always been obviously a Christian population in quotes. Now, do we accept? uh greek orthodoxy or roman catholicism uh as as christianity that's a whole other debate but th that yeah. would have been at least in the palestinian territories that's usually the the majority there are baptist pockets and pentecostal pockets and things like that but from my understanding uh at least at the time for me an arab christian was somebody who was either roman catholic uh, Protestant or some kind of form of orthodoxy, Russian, Greek, uh, or, or an Armenian Orthodox. Um, today, are there Jewish uh, converts? Yeah, but it, again, it depends on how we look at it. Uh, there, there's some that are, um, they fall into what, there it's called Messianism, me Messianic. Uh, there's some that are Messianic Jews that are more, you know, because they came to the States and studied at Dallas Theological or King's University, they go back with this, oh, we can still practice rabbinic Judaism and just put Jesus at the, at the head of it. There's that element. And then there's like communities in Jerusalem, like King of Kings, where they're like, nah, we're, we're Israeli. We, we never were religious in that way. So we don't relate to Talit and Kippahs and all that. And they look more like a church, you know, like a, like a, those mega churches, you know, where they have the music and all that. So th there's a range and a gamut, and it depends, you know, how, how much do they emphasize. So, so those those groups that are more church-like are going to be more uh, like-minded. I wouldn't say exactly with us, but more closer to us. Uh, it's just instead of worshiping in in English, you know, their worship music's in in Hebrew and 
and you know they might have pastors come in from different parts of the world but in, re in just in relation to to Jews becoming Christians or messianic for their term over there um, in just the last you know 40 50 years of the state you know and what's well, over I mean about 70 or so plus years now but in those in those last 40 or 50 um, from what I'm hearing, the numbers fluctuate, but it's been anywhere from 100 to 120,000, 150 at the most highs. So it's a lot in the sense of, of Jews in particular coming to the Lord, but in, in relation to the entire population of 6 million plus in Israel of just Jews, not including the Palestinians or Arabs. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's literally Romans 11. It's a remnant. It's not even a drop of a drop of water in a bucket. And so, so yes, the, yes, there are. And, but it's not to the extent that I would, I would like, but then again, it's, it's been prophesied that it'd only be a remnant, whatever that is. So there would be like Baptist churches potentially, at least like, or, you know, non-denominational maybe? Or, yeah, non-denominational. I, I did some research, and I did see that there's a Baptist church. It's, it's on the Palestinian territories. I don't know if there's some. I don't think that there's Jewish uh, ethnic uh, Jews that are practicing Christianity and in a Baptist sense um, that I'm aware of. They're more uh, non-denominational because a lot of the pastors that are now in Israel preaching all studied pretty much here in Dallas, you know, Dallas Theological uh, South uh, Southern Baptist Seminary here in, in South Fort Worth. So, but you will get some like mainstream, you know, churches there in, in Israel, in Israeli territory that could put that potentially have the right gospel, grace through faith, or born again, once saved, always saved. Do we do do you see that a little bit in Israel? I mean, are they there? Uh, I think they would say that again in from the mouth out, specific communities. Um, I mean, I, I can challenge you to check it out. I mean, the, the main one that, that I'm aware of in Jerusalem is called King of Kings Community. Um, it, it's kind of like a mini fun center. So it's one of those, you know, non-denom, you know. But, I mean, on their, uh, again, on their statement of faith, I mean, yeah, it says what we would like it to say, you know, our, but what is right. they're, they're definitely not going to be in favor of replacement theology. So replacement theology yeah. is taboo in Israel. You, you you will not find. I'd be surprised unless you're going to the Arab congregations, um, where where they're going to be promoting uh, anything that looks like replacement theology. So uh, if if you're in that camp, you're going to kind of be out of the loop there in Israel for sure at this point, because again, there's that hyper emphasis on Zion, Christian Zionism. And, and all that, but when I still pray, I still if I bless Israel at all, it's it's that remnant of Israel, not the state of Israel, but that remnant within that particular country and around the world that I presume are saved. And if and and if they are, that's who that's who I bless. If I'm saying I'm blessing Israel at all, but at the end of the day, I pray for all nations. I pray for everyone to come to the Lord. Right. And, and my job is to is to go out there and and preach the gospel regardless of where they're coming from because I don't know who ultimately is saved or not. So for me to say, I can't preach to you because you're gay or you're Jewish or you're Muslim or this. No, I just go into it assuming you don't know the gospel. Here it is. Right. And hopefully God helps us out from that point. Preach the gospel, preach the gospel to every creature, right, is, is what it says. So I'm going to head out, but I just wanted to ask you a final question myself. And I want to thank you, you know, on behalf of everybody uh, for coming on because uh, it's been very informative. You know, we've had a lot of guests on this show and, you know, I don't want to puff you up, <laughs> you know, puff up your head and, you know, get you prideful or anything because you've got a great attitude right now. I'm very encouraged uh, that even as a fairly young believer, you know, three years or so in the Lord, I mean, you, you've navigated through many false religions. You have a solid grasp of you know the gospel and a good balance of you know we need to preach the gospel to these people not hate them but be aware of of what's going on so you know I, hands down this has been one of the best shows i think we've had on on talk and doctrine so thanks for coming on um my question last question for me um is just one that you kind of touched on a little bit before but aside from, you know, obviously we just preach the gospel. We preach the basics of the gospel to everybody that we meet. 
but is there anything you can tell us? Is it, you know, going to Isaiah 53? Is it going to Jeremiah 31? Like what scriptures other than the, you know, Romans wrote basic verses, how can we reach these types of, you know, Jews, people who were in your position uh, with the gospel? Is there any insight on what tips and suggestions you would give us to go out and to reach these, you know, to reach Jews, unbelieving Jews for the, for the gospel? Yeah. Um, so again, I'm, I'm of the camp where we just presented anyway, but there are cases that I've experienced in the few times that I've spoken to Jews um, where, where they're just not going to accept anything from the new Testament. And so I guess I have to, in theory, supplement uh, verses from, from the old. And so for example, in the, in, in just the first step of recognizing that you're a sinner, you know, uh, you know, I'll go to the first one that I can think of is Genesis uh, in, in chapter three, where God's telling Eve, here's the tree and, and don't eat from it. Cause if you do, if you transgress what I'm about to say, you're surely going to die. So if first you see right then and there, she's, she's going to sin or about to sin in the next few verses. And the result of that sin is death. And so that parallels showing the person, well, you know, you recognize your sin and the consequence for sin is death. So the New Testament is saying exactly what the old is. And, and I've asked Jews, I, I, you know, the few times that, I, that I've able to meet with them, I said, what guarantee do you have from rabbinic Judaism for eternal life? And they're looking at me with a blank stare like, I don't even know. I said, well, if you died today, what would you do? Let's, let's put Jesus aside for a second, God forbid. But, but just to, if you saw God right now, you died, what, what would you say? What, what's, your, what's your way in? Well, I would hope, you know, that, that, that it's not that I, because I was a good person or I did these, you know, good things that God would have mercy. And I'm like, no, I mean, look at Isaiah chapter one. He's upset with all your sacrifices and all your false religion. And he, he's looking for ethical, moral, ethical aspects that are going to, obviously, post-salvation, you should be practicing. And so those are kind of just off the top of my head verses that I would show to a Jew and say, look, you know, you, you, whatever it is they're teaching you in your synagogue, it's, it's not what the Bible says. So, I mean, if you don't want to hear the New Testament, well, then let's look at the old or let's or I'll use terminology like the Tanakh or so that they don't get over, you know, you know, upset or something if I say Old Testament. But but I'll say, let's look at the text itself and let, let the text speak to you. What does it say? And right away, you, you start seeing, again, the, the window to the soul is the, is the eyes. And you begin to see people start thinking. And, um, okay, I see what you're saying. And so even if they're not convinced at that moment, I at least know I did my job. My job is to present the gospel. And, and, but, again, I... I I, I'm I'm adamant about you don't have to package it Jewishly. You just if you give it to them, if if, if they know, if they're meant to know it, it's going to resonate with me right away. You just feel that I don't know how to explain it. It's just for those that are in faith and in Jesus Christ, you know what I mean without having to explain it in words. And 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 if that person's meant to have a Jew or not, they, they they're going to convert. But but yeah, I mean I can give you later some specific verses that I have uh, written out and planned out that are side by side. But those are the few that I can think of off the top of my head for the moment, right? Yeah, now. that would be that would be very helpful, you know, to have. So, and and I agree. I mean, just use the Talmud or rabbinic Judaism because yeah. most Jews are not even going to know that anyway. So, right? No, of course not. I mean, I I like the idea of using the Old Testament parallels to Romans or parallels to the New Testament because it's all there too. Yeah. You know, you yeah, have, it's, it's there. You know, just worded differently, but it's there. Yeah, you have original sin, and then you have the prophecies of the Messiah, you know, and of course that'll get them thinking about Jesus. And, you know, obviously if you can get them the New Testament and show them the scripture and have them receive it, that's better, that's ideal. But um, while we have the core of the gospel, the backbone of the gospel is the same to everybody, uh, it doesn't hurt to understand that we can go to Genesis and say, look, you know, God said you would die if you eat of the fruit of a tree of knowledge of good and evil, you know, that and no one is righteous, you know, not, no, not one. And so there's those. And so I, I think that's a good approach. Um, there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. 
That's an Old Testament verse. <laughs> exactly. I think it's from one of the Psalms, and it's paralleled later in the New Testament. So even if yep. you don't want the New Testament, you show them the Psalms, and they, I mean, it's all there. And I mean, another good one is Jeremiah chapter 31, the one that initially convicted me, where, where you say New Covenant, and if they're, if they're decent enough in Hebrew, challenge them. And if you have a Hebrew, I, I, even, I even recommend, get from the Trini Trinity uh, uh, Bible Society, get a Hebrew version, and if you know enough of the Hebrew or can look at it, ask them, what does New Covenant mean here? And if they know enough Hebrew, right away, that's going to hit them in the face the way it hit me, because the, the most hated word is Brit Chadasha, and you'll see that right in your face, and, and there you're left with a, with a decision. Whoa, what just happened here? The word that, I, that I'm taught to dislike so much, especially in Israel, and it's facing me right in, 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 into my eyes off the page of the text, you, you got to deal with that at some point. So you, you're at least going to plant a seed. That's the main one that I would throw at, for sure. Amazing. And then Isaiah 53 and all the traditional ones. Amazing. Well, I'm going to run. You guys, you know, I don't have to tell you. You know, you guys keep going if you want. But um, I just wanted to thank you. You know, it's been a, it's been a very informative. It's just very refreshing to get an objective view firsthand from the source from somebody who has the right gospel, who, you know, professes Jesus Christ by grace through faith alone. Um, and so that's just great. Rather than having all these biases and this hatred and, you know, trying to just crush the Jews and all this stuff, which we see from this anti-Zionist extreme, um, whereas we can be anti-Zionist in the sense that we know that's all being built up for the Antichrist without forgetting that we need to be preaching the gospel to every creature and to do it in a spirit of you know meekness and gentleness and exactly. and christ's love you know it doesn't save anybody to yell at them and to say you're the synagogue of satan you know it doesn't that doesn't save anybody that's not going to work you know so i so thanks again you know praise the lord you know well, i thank, thank you, god i for appreciate your it and look forward to many more conversations I hope, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I look forward to that. And uh, I'm sure we'll have more discussions, you know, as, as time goes on throughout the years even, because there's you're going to be on a journey where you're going to be preaching and doing all this stuff. And, you know, we could always use that that kind of insight um, into into actual Judaism, you know, of not just what we have heard what it is, but going to that source and understanding it from, you know, an actual somebody who's who's experienced it and, and gone through it firsthand. So and thank you. I'm at your service. Whatever I can do to help you in your ministry or any of you other gentlemen in your ministries, I'm just a click away. Amen. God bless you all. I'm just going to exit and, and just catch you know, listen. Thank you so much. Be well.